Proper search engine optimization or SEO can make or break your website. It can put your website on top of everyone's mind or let it be forgotten on the 10th page of the Google search results. On that note, hi guys, welcome to this complete SEO tutorial by Simply Learn. In this video, we'll be covering some of the most important concepts related to search engine optimization. We'll talk about keyword research, Google Analytics, Google Tag Manager, how you can rank number one on Google and YouTube, how to increase YouTube subscribers, how to get traffic to your website, some popular SEO tools, and finally, some SEO tips and tricks. First off, we'll have an introduction to SEO by our instructors, Rob and Matt. Welcome, my name is Rob Sanders. I'm a course instructor at Simply Learn. Today, we're going to talk about why you would want to rank using SEO, and SEO is search engine optimization, also known as organic search. You also may as hear us say organic listings. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about why you'd want to rank your website in organic search. Okay, what is search engine optimization? Then we're going to follow that up with how does Google rank websites? So why does it rank one website over another? And how do we get our website to rank number one? Then we're going to talk about the different types of SEO or search engine optimization techniques. So you can get your website ranked number one. And then we're going to finish that off with the do's and don'ts of SEO. So let's get right to it and talk about why SEO. So we're going to use a basic example. And let's just say you have a blog. You're a food blogger. You're passionate about food. And your niche is ice cream. And let's just say you have a lot of ice cream recipes. You want to get traffic to your blog. You want people to read your blog. And you're curious, why am I not ranking for my blog? Why, when people type in ice cream recipes and say Google, my blog posts don't appear at the top of organic rankings? And there's a number of reasons why you wouldn't be ranked for your blog post or your ice cream recipes. And the main reason would be your competitors. So there could be somebody else out there who is also passionate about ice cream and has been blogging a long, longer than you. And they have more content and more blog posts and more pages for Google to rank. So that's usually the number one reason. The other reason is improper usage of keywords. And we're going to talk a little bit or it's actually a lot more about, you know, keyword usage in your content. So what kind of keywords do you want to rank for? That's really what we're talking about when we talk about usage of keywords. What keywords do you want to rank for and how do we work those keywords into the content? Another reason is poor link building practices. And really that means are other blog posts or other websites linking to you? Also, are you linking to other pages on your website? And so it's all about link building. And with link building, it's internal linking. So are we linking from one blog post to another? And it's external linking. Are other websites of high quality linking to us? And so that's what we talk about when we talk about link building. And then another reason is web page load time. So you could be running your blog post on, say, WordPress, for example, and your blog post isn't loading fast enough. Well, if you look at it this way, think about it if you're Google. Would you really want to rank a website or blog post in this example, number one on Google rankings, if that particular page loaded very slow? No, you wouldn't because when somebody clicked on that link in organic search and went to your website, they're going to have a bad experience because the page is going to load slow. So Google doesn't want their users to have a bad experience. You don't want your users to have a bad experience. And so that's why web page load time is a critical factor for ranking. So we need to make sure that our web pages load fast. And then your user experience is not good enough. So Google, again, based on my example about the web page load time, Google wants people to have a good experience when they go from their search engine to your website. And there's a lot pl at play there, specifically web page load time, but also, you know, Google doesn't want any spam content. Google doesn't want any pop ups or overbearing ads on the web page. They want people who are searching for something in particular, let's just say ice cream recipes, and they want to find a relevant website that has ice cream recipes. They want to be able to click on that link and read some good content about ice cream recipes. It's that simple. And that's really what Google's trying to create in their environment. And that's you as an end user. As a website owner, you want your users to have a good experience. And then 
Last but not least, your website is de-indexed by mistake. And really what we mean is de-indexed is Google needs to be able to index all the pages on your website. So if you have a blog with 100 recipes, you want Google to have access to all 100 recipes. So we're gonna talk a little bit later about how to get your pages ranked or indexed on Google Organic Search. So let's move on to what is SEO. So sticking with our ice cream blog theme, really SEO, search engine optimization, really is the practice of increasing your pages that Google has indexed up the rankings. So the end result is we want all our pages to be ranked number one for particular keywords. So if you wanna be ranked for ice cream recipes, well, there's certain things you need to do. So that's generally how it works. We need to apply search engine optimization to increase a page for keyword we wanna be found for. So let me give you an example. So let's just say there's 100 students that participated in an essay competition. And so the competition in this particular case is evaluated on the basis of, is the content relevant? Are they using suitable titles for their essay? Do they have structure when they're participating in this essay or talking about the essay? And do they have a suitable synopsis? And is the content neat and readable? These seem all logical for an essay competition. Well, guess what? They seem logical for SEO because that's exactly how SEO works. It's exactly all those points I just mentioned about structure, logic, readability, organization, title. All those things are what's important in SEO. And so we need relevant content. We need titles for our pages. Google needs to be able to see structure. We need to have synopsis of what the page is about, and that's called the meta description. And then again, the, the content needs to be readable, and that's important. And so in order to be readable, again, we're gonna talk more about site speed because site speed's important. Okay. And when we talk about responsive design, when I say responsive design, that means your site, your page needs to load both on desktop and also on mobile. And so all these things are important. Just like an essay competition, Google is the judge and they need to be able to determine what page is best to rank number one, number two, number three, et cetera, on Google search. And then link building. Remember I mentioned link building a moment ago? Well, link building internally and externally also plays a vital role. And so we're gonna talk about that a little bit later in the class when we talk about off-page SEO. How does Google rank website? And basically, Google follows three basic steps to rank a website. They need to crawl your website. They need to take what they crawl back to their servers. And when they take it back to their servers, your, your web pages, they need to you have them available for indexing. So when somebody actually types in a keyword into google.com, it'll be available to be found on organic search. So that's what indexing is all about. And then Google's job when somebody does type in a search query is to basically rank the, those pages that they've indexed from number one to infinity, depending on how many pages are relevant to that search query. So really it's about crawling, indexing, and ranking. So crawling is simply a process done by which Google has bots. And what these bots do is they go to your web server and they're going to crawl every page that they can find. And how do they find these pages? Well, they basically follow links. You might've heard the term spidering, but that's what they call search engine spidering. So basically what Google's doing is they're building a web, so to speak, all the links that they're following. And so when they can follow all these links on your website, they're gonna be able to crawl them. And when they crawl them, basically they're gonna take that content and store it on their servers so it's available in their index. So based on this method, Google finds out which websites have relevant content and which ones don't based on certain keywords that are typed into Google. Because if they can't crawl your website, you're not gonna be found. And if you can't be found, then you're not gonna show up for relevant keywords. So we need to make sure your site's available to be crawled. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, but let's show you an example. So let's just go to Google search. And if I type in the keyword simply learn, okay, I could see I have 1,010,000 results. Okay, and that's how many results are showing up for simply learn. Okay, now they may not all be simply learn pages, but nonetheless, simply learned is ranked number one here organically. And there are 1,010,000 pages related to the keyword simply learn. 
Now, when it comes to organic search, uh, we don't want to get it confused with paid search. So anytime you see paid search, you're going to see something that says ad next to it. Okay, so we could see that there are paid ads here. But when it comes to organic search, those are generally below paid ads. And so that's where Google counts the 1,010,000 results. And so that's the whole idea behind crawling and indexing. Google's able to crawl Simply Learn's website and based on all the pages that they gather, they're going to make those pages available in organic search. So if you type in a keyword and your web page is not available for indexing, then you're never going to show up for that keyword. So that's why it's important to make sure your website is available for crawling and indexing. And so when a user types a query on search Google search, the most relevant websites that are in Google's index are going to appear in the search results. So in the example I gave uh, with Simply Learn, well, Simply Learn is the brand name of the company Simply Learn. So there's a lot of relevancy there. So that's why you see Simply Learn show up here organically number one. Like we mentioned about what is SEO and why SEO, we talked about that user experience. So there's a lot of factors that go into ranking, relevancy being one of them. So in the Simply Learn example, Simply Learn is relevant to a lot of the Simply Learn pages because that's who they are, Simply Learn. However, Simply Learn also needs to make sure that, you know, for their pages, the page load time is fast, meaning these pages load very fast for the end user. And Google also takes into account other factors, like how long someone is staying on a website, or are they bouncing, meaning are they going to one page that they land on and then leaving the website? Okay, and so the user experience is very, very important. There are other factors also like language and location. And so, for example, location, if you do a search, say in India, the results are going to be a little bit different than, say, the results in the United States. Why? Because Google is indexing as many web pages as they can find. So if somebody's doing a search in India, their results may be a little bit different than the results show up in the US because Google has different bots and these bots are crawling different pages at different times and so google's index is updating continuously but it's not real-time syncing so if you do a search in india you may not see exactly the same thing because both search engines the google in india and the google in the us are may not be exactly synced up so an example would be you know if you're looking for cafe so if you search a cafe in say san francisco you're going to see different results. Now, if you do a search for cafes in Mumbai, you're going to see different results. There's going to be local search here at the top. There may be some paid search, but again, you may see different results because one location, but two, Google search engines in India and United States, google.com, aren't exactly synced up exactly at the same exact time you do that search. So location is important language is important and relevancy is important along with user experience so all those are important factors in how google ranks websites okay so we're going to talk about the types of seo now so if we want to rank for a particular keyword on google we're going to have to apply search engine optimization and so there's two strategies to search engine optimization on-page seo and off-page seo so first we're going to talk about on-page SEO. So on-page SEO is nothing more than optimizing your own website. And so when we say optimizing your own website, there's certain elements on your website and on your web pages that we need to take into account. And so some of those elements are headers, meta descriptions, title tags, linking. So all of those elements are something we can control as an end user who wants to rank our web page and our website on Google. And before we do anything with our website, the first thing we need to do is understand what keywords we want to rank for. In order to understand what keywords we want to rank for, we need to do keyword research. And if you do anything in SEO, keyword research is the most important activity. 
That's the most important thing you can do for SEO. And why do I say it's the most important? Because you need to understand if you choose a keyword that you want to rank for, you need to understand how much traffic you're going to get from that keyword if you're ranked organically, say number one on Google. So how much traffic will you get if you're ranked number one on Google? So you need to understand what the volume is. And then number two, we need to understand what the competition is for that keyword that you want to rank for. So if you choose a keyword and there's not much competition for it, then chances are you can rank for that keyword for a web page on your website quicker than say a keyword that has a lot of competition. So we need to understand those two basic factors volume and competition before we choose a keyword. And it's it's simply the practice of going through the motions of getting your volume and getting your competition data so you can choose the keywords you want. And then once you choose the keywords you want, then you can go and apply on page SEO. You can change the title tag, the meta descriptions, the headers. All those elements can be changed, but first you need to choose your keywords. And so again, the primary components we're looking for are how much traffic you can get or the search volume, how much competition there is for that keyword, and of course, relevancy. Okay, you need to be able to choose a keyword that's relevant to the web page you're trying to rank for. And so let me show you an example of how to go through this. So the first thing we want to do is we want to use a tool. And the tool I would recommend is Google Keyword Planner. And why do I choose Google Keyword Planner? Because if we're trying to rank on Google.com or Google search engine, we want to be able to get the data right from the source. So Google's going to be able to give us information about how much volume a keyword has and how much competition it has. So let me show you an example. So if I want to use Google's Keyword Planner and I want to rank for the keyword how to become a digital marketing specialist, then I'm going to type that keyword into Google's Keyword Planner. And what Google's going to do is they're going to give me some trends about how much volume this particular keyword gets over the course of a year. And so for that particular keyword, I can see that there are trends that, that appear for both desktop and mobile. So mobile is important because people start their search process a lot of times on their mobile device. So we want to be able to get data from mobile as well as desktop. And so we could see a trend here that for each particular month, over the last 12 months, we can see how much volume this particular keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist, gets per month. And so on average, on average, over the past 12 months, I could see how to become a digital marketing specialist is averages 30 searches a month. And this is on Google.com. And so Google gives us the volume. What they also give us is the competition. And so here I can see Google says for that particular keyword, the competition is medium. And so in the Google's keyword planner, what they also do is give me other relevant keywords that I might think about optimizing for. Because you don't want to optimize for just one keyword. So how to become a digital marketing specialist, they're going to also offer up other types of keywords that are relevant. So just digital marketing specialist, social media marketing specialist. So for those keywords, I can see the volume. So for example, digital marketing specialist, I can see the average volume is 1,000 per month. On average over the last 12 months, I can also see the competition is medium. But for some other keywords, I can see the search volume being high, like digital marketing course at 2,900 per month, but also the competition is high. And so what I would recommend as a best practice is to collect all your relevant keywords, okay? And put all your relevant keywords in a spreadsheet. And when you put all these relevant keywords in a spreadsheet, you wanna get the data on those keywords. And the data I'm referring to is the volume and competition. So in this case, we have volume from Google Planner, Google's Keyword Planner, and I have competition from Google's Keyword Planner. And so if I go into a spreadsheet and I put all that information in here, I'm going to be able to see the volume and competition. And so that's important. However, one thing to note here is that Google's Keyword Planner, if I go back, just gives us low, medium, and high. And if I want to compare numbers to numbers, Maybe I want to be able to get exactly the competition number for the, the keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist. What I can do is go into Google and I can type in that keyword. So if I type in the keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist, I can see there's 76 million results 
So I could see 76 million results, 76.1 actually, and for the keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist. Now that's a whole lot of results for this particular keyword, especially when the volume is only 30 uh, per month on average. And so what I wanna do is get a, a more clear picture of the competition. And so what you could actually do is type in the syntax all in title and then colon and then your keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist. And when I do that, I get a different result. Here I can see only 136 listings for how to become a digital marketing specialist. But that's not just 136, that's 136 with that particular keyword that we wanna rank for in the title tag, okay? So the title tag is what you see when you type in a keyword or search query in Google search, and the title tag is what you see at the top of every search result. And so now I can see I typed in how to become a digital marketing specialist with the all in title syntax. And now I can see every listing, every one of these 136 results have that particular keyword in it. So I could see every one of them, how to become a digital marketing specialist. And why is that important? Because now that tells me I only need to climb over 136 listings to rank for that keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist. And so the idea here is you wanna get your volume from Google's Keyword Planner, but you wanna get your competition from Google Search. And again, that's simply typing in the, the syntax, how in title, and then your keyword. In this example, how to become a digital marketing specialist. Once you get those two numbers, you're gonna plug them in to your spreadsheet. And then once you do that for a number of different keyword queries, and these keyword queries, again, have to be relevant. Once you do that, then you can go in and pick the keywords you wanna optimize for. And that's important because, again, if you're not sure about a keyword, then you wanna do the keyword research so you can be sure of how much traffic you can get and how much competition there is. Those are two important, three important factors in starting the process for on-page SEO. So again, okay, you want to create content for say a keyword like digital marketing, but digital marketing may seem a little bit broad. So you wanna probably stay away from broader keywords because broader keywords tend to have a lot of volume, which is great, but they may also tend to have a lot of competition. But that's the whole point of doing the keyword research. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe there's more volume than competition. That's what you need to find out when you do the keyword research. You need to find those keywords that are relevant to your content that have a lot of volume and low competition. And then once we identify those keywords, then we are free to go in and start optimizing our web pages for those keywords. And the first place we wanna start is the title tag. So if you remember my example, going back here to our search, how to become a digital marketing specialist, we saw that every one of these listings had that keyword in the title tag. And the title tag is important because that's what users who use Google search see first when they type in a query and get results. So they're gonna see the title tag. So the title tag is the most important element for on-page SEO. It's the most important factor because that's what people see. And so ideally when we choose our keyword, we wanna make sure that keyword is in the title tag because that's what shows up in Google search. And that's what makes that particular web page relevant for that keyword query. So the idea behind a title tag, it's between 50 and 60 characters. And so we wanna make sure we stay within that limit, no more than 60 characters, because what happens if it's beyond that, then Google will truncate the title tag. So if I go back to my search, you can see here on this particular title tag, Google truncated it, meaning they added the ellipses after the title tag because it exceeded the 60 character limit. So you wanna stay within those character counts. And so the title tag is the first place you should start when optimizing your website. Because when we have the right keyword in the title tag and somebody types in that keyword, then chances are it's gonna be relevant, they're gonna see it, and they're gonna click through to your website. And that's the whole idea behind ranking. We wanna get clicks. 
So that's how the title tag appears. So when you optimize it, you're going to update the title tag and this is how it shows up. It's gonna show up at the top of your listing, okay? And it's gonna be bigger and bolder than anything else Google displays. So the second thing you wanna optimize is the meta description. And the meta description is simply just a brief description up to 155, I would say about 155 to 60, 160 characters, but probably no more than that. And so the meta description is nothing more than a summary of the web page itself. So if I go back to my Google search results, I see my title tag and I see the page that this particular listing belongs to. And underneath that is where I can see my meta description. So in this particular keyword query, how to become a digital marketing specialist, I see the meta description, an ultimate guide on how to build a career in digital marketing and the skills required to become a digital marketing specialist. Note that it's a well-written meta description with 155 characters, and it includes the keyword digital marketing specialist. So we're trying to rank for how to become a digital marketing specialist. And here you can see become a digital marketing specialist. So there's a lot of relevancy between not only the title tag and the keyword, but the meta description and the keyword. So when you're optimizing a keyword, you wanna start with the title tag, but you also want to update the meta description. Because if you don't update the meta description and you leave the meta description blank, then you're leaving it to Google to add in copy that they deem relevant. And so for on-page SEO, we wanna take control of the copy and we wanna optimize it for the keywords we wanna be found for. So the meta description is a powerful tool at our disposal. It gives us more characters to work with. It gives us more to talk about. So for that particular page. And so if the title tag is only 60 characters maximum, it's not a lot of information to try and get somebody to click. So the meta description helps us in identifying what that page is about in order to get the click. So the two working in tandem will hopefully increase your click-through rates. So when you're found organically, we wanna get the click. And then the third element that's important is the URL. And URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. And why is the URL so important? Because that's what people see. So if I go back to my search result, how to become a digital marketing specialist, notice that the URL also includes how to become a digital marketing specialist article. Okay, so it's very relevant, the URL is very relevant. One, we can see it in the search results. But two, you know, it's relevant to the keyword query. And that's important for the end user and Google. Google wants to know, hey, is this the page that's relevant to the user's query? And if it is, then this user's likely gonna have a good ex user experience after they click on the listing. So the URL is an element that helps not only with the click-through rate, but with ranking. And having a poor URL structure doesn't help at all because not only does Google not recognize the URL as being relevant, but the end user may not want to click on that page given the, the way the URL looks. So you wanna try and avoid a poor URL structure. So the rule of thumb is this, if you don't understand what the URL is, then Google is likely not going to understand what the URL is. And so we wanna try and keep our URL structures clean. And when I say clean, ideally you wanna make sure that whatever keyword you're trying to optimize, that's the keyword that's included in the URL nothing included that is not understandable. So again, going back to our example, how to become a digital marketing specialist. It's very clean. The title tag is the keyword. The meta description is cleanly written, has the keyword. And then the URL is the other element that the end user can see. And that URL includes the keyword in it. So after we've done those three elements, the title tag, the meta description, and the URL, then we wanna start optimizing the page itself. So ideally, when we say optimize the page itself, the page, remember, needs to be structured. And when we say structured, it needs to be structured in terms of you know headers and subheaders and organized in a manner in which the end user can read the article, read the content clearly and concisely without being confused. And so that's the job of headers. They Add, they add basically an organizational structure to the content. And with headers, there's a hierarchy. 
So you have anywhere from H1, which is the top of the hierarchy, to an H6. And so you're free to use any one of those headers when building out a page in order to organize the content. But ideally, you probably want to stick with an H1 or an H2 because those are at the top of the hierarchy. And what those do is they actually stress to Google that, hey, this header with this particular keyword in it is important. So if you use an H6 with the keyword in it, it's telling Google, hey, this is an H6, but it's not as important. So an H1 and an H2 tag show importance. And so let's look at an example of what that is. So here you can see an H1 is going to be at the top of the hierarchy. So that means it's going to be bigger and bolder. Then you have an H2, which is going to be bigger and bolder than an H3, but not as big and bold as an H2. So with headers, not only are you organizing the content accordingly, but you're also signaling to Google how important that particular header is. And of course, the header needs to include the keyword we're trying to rank for. So let's take a look again at that example. So if we go to how to become a digital marketing specialist, if I click on that page, I can look at the content and I can see that there are headers in here. So the headers are there to organize the content. And that's what we want. We want to be able to organize the content. And if you look at the other example I'm showing here, how to become a digital marketing specialist, uh, learning paths explored, you can see that's an H1, but below it's a subheader, the growing digital marketing job market. So that's an H2. And so we're not stressing to Google that that's more important than an H1, but nonetheless, we're stressing to Google that it's important nonetheless. So we want to be able to use headers. We want to be able to use keywords in our headers in order to stress to Google what's important, and also to organize the content because Google likes content organized. Okay, the next element we want to focus on is internal linking. And so internal linking, if you remember uh, earlier in the presentation, is basically links from one page on your website to another. And so here we can see on this particular article, how to become a digital marketing specialist. There's also links to other pages on Simply Learn's website. And so for this particular content, it also links to SEO specialist, PPC specialist, social media marketing specialist, and digital marketing specialist. So the whole idea behind internal linking is to link from one page to another where it's relevant. And in this case, it's relevant because we're talking about how to become a digital marketing specialist. That's what the whole content is about. And so what Simply Learn is doing here is offering up other pages on their website that are relevant to becoming a digital marketing specialist. And so this is a best practice when you're optimizing a web page. So you want to be able to have internal linking on your site. And the whole idea behind internal linking is it also allows users to navigate through the site naturally. So when I say naturally, they don't always have to refer back to the top navigation. They can naturally and seamlessly go from one relevant article or page to another. And so that's the whole idea behind link building and internal link building. It allows Google to identify you know, pages that they want to crawl and index because they're linked to one another. But it also helps the end user because it allows the end user to go from one page to another. And it's signaling to Google, hey, this particular page is linked to this page. So we're going to also index that page. And so that's the whole important part of internal linking. It's about the end user experience and it's about allowing Google to find the pages on your website so they can crawl them and index them so you can be ranked for them. And so also, in addition to internal linking, we want to be able to use natural language. And so what do I mean by natural language or natural language processing? So what Google does is, in terms of natural language processing, they're looking for the content and the keyword. It needs to be relevant. So when your website is about digital marketing, you don't necessarily want to rank or try to rank for the keyword digital marketing. One, it's too broad. Two, there might be some competition. But three, you're probably not going to write something as broad like digital marketing. So ideally, what you want to do is you want to choose other 
relevant related keywords that's going to be more natural and so that's what we mean by natural language processing we want to choose keywords that are more natural to the content you're writing so instead of the keyword digital marketing maybe we want to talk about the types of digital marketing or digital marketing examples or what is a digital marketing strategy or how to become a digital marketing specialist so those are all relevant keywords to digital marketing and more relevant to the content because if you try to rank for the keyword digital marketing, again, it's probably gonna be a little bit broad, probably more competition, and not as relevant to your content. And as a result, probably not a good user experience. So think about some other keywords that you could optimize and rank for. And that goes back to the keyword research. That's why the keyword research is so important because it allows us to identify other keywords in the natural language process. What keywords are more relevant for the content? And then another element to on-page SEO is the sitemap. And so with a sitemap, it's basically a list of all the pages on your website. And the whole idea of listing all the pages on your website in one document is it helps both users and search engines understand the structure of your website. So there are two types of sitemaps. One's an HTML sitemap, and that's designed for humans. So if you have a website with a lot of content, at the footer or the bottom of your web page, you probably want to have a link to sitemap. So if somebody clicks on that sitemap, they're going to be able to see all the pages on your website structured in an organized manner. Well, an XML sitemap, and XML is just a different format, it's designed for crawlers. And so the whole idea, remember, is Google likes to crawl content. When they crawl content, they bring it back to their servers and index it. And so we want to be able to create a sitemap for Google or other search engine crawlers. And so XML is the format. So let me show you an example of how that looks. So if I go to simplylearn.com and simply type in, say, sitemap.xml, just as an example, I'm going to get this particular page. And this particular page displays two XML sitemaps. So these sitemaps are there for Google to go ahead and crawl and nothing more than a list of all the pages on your website. And so this is a quick and easy way for Google to get a hold of all those pages so that they can index them. And that's the whole idea behind SEO. You want to be able to have Google index all the content you want to be found for, for the keywords you want to be found for. So it all starts with the sitemap. So let's go from on-page SEO, which in recap is basically optimizing certain elements on your website so that you are relevant for a particular keyword. And that meant updating the title tag, the meta description, the URL, the headers, choosing the right keywords to put into the content, having internal linking, and also updating the sitemap. Well, those are elements that you can do on your website. So we're going to switch gears and talk about a different strategy, off-page SEO. Because without on-page or off-page, you can't have a page ranking. So the two work together. So you can do as much as you want on on-page, but you still need off-page SEO. And you could do all the off-page SEO you want, but you still need on-page. So both of these strategies have to be in full effect in order for you to rank. So let's now switch gears to off-page SEO. And so off-page SEO is simply the process of linking or promoting your website using link building. And so if you remember, I talked about this earlier on. There's two types of links, internal, and external linking. And so for on-page SEO, we used internal linking. For off-page SEO, we're gonna talk about external linking. And external linking allows us to improve our website's recognition or relevancy or credibility. And why do we want to improve our relevancy and credibility and trustworthiness and authority? Because we want Google to know that our web page is trustworthy. It is recognized by other websites and it is relevant for a particular keyword. And so if we can do that using off-page SEO methods, then Google's going to rank our web page for the keyword we want to be found for. So it's really off-page SEO is synonymous with link building. And there's plenty of opportunities to do link building. It just comes down to creating a strategy. So again, some of the benefits to off-page, well, we talked about 
you know, being credible and trustworthiness and relevant, we need to do that in order to rank. But there's some other benefits there. So if we have a link on another credible website, then it's likely going to increase the traffic to our own website. It also creates high domain authority. And so what I mean by high domain authority is if we have basically links to other web pages, pointing back to us, then basically our domain authority is going to improve. And when our domain authority improves, other websites are gonna to wanna to link to us. So the higher authoritative we are for our website, then other web pages are gonna to want to link to us. And so the more external linking we have, the higher the domain authority. So it all starts with linking to other high domain authority websites. So linking to a high domain authority website, for example, having a link on Wikipedia that points back to our web page creates high domain authority for us and it helps drive traffic. So some of the other benefits of off-page SEO are credibility. So if we're linking from Wikipedia to our web page, it does create credibility for us. It also helps us increase our page rank. So remember that external linking helps build domain authority, helps build credibility, trustworthiness, and it's going to in turn help us rank for that particular page. And then certainly not last, Having a good off-page SEO link building strategy increases our brand awareness because if we're on other high authority websites, Wikipedia, or say a social platform, it's going to increase our brand awareness and increasing our brand awareness increases our trustworthiness. And so if somebody is looking to say, become a digital marketing specialist, then likely instead of typing in digital marketing specialist on Google, they may type in our brand name, in this case, Simply Learn. And so these are all the benefits to off-page SEO. So it's nothing more than having links on other websites that are pointing back to ours. And again, there's lots of benefits. It drives, helps drive traffic and increases our authority. So those are things that we want to take advantage of when we want to rank. And the key behind off-page SEO or link building is always going to be content. So from an on-page SEO perspective, having quality content allows that content to be optimized for a relevant keyword and ranked. But also from an off-page SEO strategy, having high quality content allows us to have other sites and it doesn't necessarily have to be a website. It could be a social platform or it can be another blogging platform or blogging website linked back to ours. Why? Because the content is original. It's natural. It's well-structured. It reads well. And so that's the whole idea behind Offpage. You can't have links on other websites if you don't have quality content. So one of the ideas behind Offpage SEO is not only do you want to create good content, but you probably want to spend a lot of time or a bit of time on others' websites. So remember the example I used earlier in this presentation about having an ice cream blog and ice cream recipes? Well, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to say, spend some time on other blogs related to desserts related to cakes, related to food in general, related to vegetables or other items that people could link from. So the whole idea is understanding who else is out there, who has relevant content that you could share. So you could share your content with them, they can share their content with you. And generally that's how it works naturally anyway. In the web sphere, if somebody likes your content, they're gonna link to it. They don't necessarily have to wait for you to ask them but it might not be a bad idea to understand who else is out there that has content similar to yours so that you can you know, get a link on that particular website or blog post. And so some other ideas behind having external links pointing back to your website is social media. So social media is not just Facebook or Twitter, but it expands beyond that. There's, there's Quora, there's Medium, there's all sorts of content generated websites like Reddit. So the list goes on and on. You just need to find what's relevant for your content. If it's relevant for your content, then it's worth putting or trying to get the external link on that social media platform. And then again, going back to my ice cream blog recipes, blog post. Yeah, if you find a particular blog that you want to have an external link on, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to that particular blogger. 
you know, in some cases very flattering, but in other cases, if the content is relevant, then why not? It's only going to help your end user experience. If you add somebody who has, a, say, a blog about cakes, having their link on your blog post. So there's nothing wrong with it because it also adds to the user experience. And if you're gonna ask somebody to put an external link on theirs, you might want to be open-minded and make sure that you are able and willing to put an external link on your blog post or website pointing to their content. That's how the web works, especially if the content's of quality, relevant, and of good nature. Okay, so let's move on and finish up with the do's and don'ts of SEO. So we talked a lot about you know, why SEO, what is SEO, you know, how do we rank for SEO, you know, what is on-page SEO, what is off-page SEO. And so let's just wrap up with some of the things you, again, want to do to rank your page for a particular keyword and some of the things you don't want to do. So the first thing on the list is optimize for white hat techniques. And what I mean for opting in for white hat techniques is basically everything I just mentioned today. You want to do keyword research. You want to choose a natural language processing form format so you could choose keywords that are going to be relevant natural to the content. And you don't want to opt for black hat techniques. And black hat techniques are probably not even worth going into detail. But one example is choosing a keyword arbitrarily like say digital marketing and just stuffing that keyword into the content. So that's probably not something you want to do because again, it's not gonna be good for the end user. So stay away from black hat and focus on some of the techniques we talked about in today's presentation. The other do we wanna do is get backlinks from relevant sites. So that's off-page SEO. Again, it's what I mentioned earlier. It's about linking your quality content to another person's website that also has quality content. We don't want to have a backlink from an irrelevant site. Why? Because it's not going to be relevant and it's also going to hurt our authority because if it's on a site that's not of good quality, then Google's going to look at us and say, well, this site is linking to your site, but it's not relevant. So therefore, you know, we're not going to look at you in the same way as if you were on a quality website. We do want to use our keywords naturally because title tags are what people see first on organic search. But you don't want to use the same title tag on every page of your website. So we want to stay away from doing that. So you want to have a unique title tag for every web page on your website. And ideally, what does that mean? That means using our keyword research to choose one to two keywords per page and optimizing your web page for those one to two keywords. So you ideally, what you want to do is have one to two different keywords for every page on your website. We definitely, definitely, definitely want to write engaging content. So the content should be engaging. Remember, user experience. We want users to stay on our website. We want them to enjoy the content that they're reading. And we want them to go from one page to another naturally. We definitely don't want to leverage or plagiarize or just copy content from others' websites because it's not, one, probably going to be relevant to what you're writing about. Two, it's duplicate content, and it's somebody else's. So that's a black cat technique we wanna stay away from. I can't emphasize this enough, we need to do keyword research first before you do anything else. You need to find relevant keywords, and not only that, you need to understand the volume and the competition for each of those keywords. Okay, you don't wanna choose a keyword that has low volume, high competition. You wanna choose a keyword that has high volume, low competition. But above all, you want to choose keywords that are relevant to your content. We want to avoid keyword stuffing, so don't take a keyword and just stuff it everywhere on the page. It's not going to be natural, and Google's going to be able to pick up on that. So we want to maintain some level of quality with our content and quality with the keywords that we choose. So reminder, when you have quality content, it's always going to link internally to another page on your website with quality content, but it's gotta be natural. And don't just build site-wide backlinks, meaning don't just have an internal link to the homepage, or don't have every page on your website linking to just one page. So internal linking should be natural, naturally linking from one page to another. Not only does it help Google understand and crawl all the web pages on your website, 
but it's good for the end user. It's good user experience. And certainly last, but something I didn't talk about, it does take time to rank your content. So remember the process. You're gonna write your content. You're going to choose keywords. You're going to change the elements on that page for those keywords. And all the while, you're gonna make sure Google can crawl that content. And when they crawl it, they're gonna index it. The process takes time, especially if you choose a keyword that's competitive. So just be patient. If you have quality content and you've optimized for on-page SEO and off-page SEO, then you will rank for that keyword. And then make sure your website's user-friendly and mobile-friendly. So we talked about responsive content earlier. So remember, most users today start the process of search on mobile. So we want to make sure your websites are mobile-friendly. Well, to get this conversation started, uh, here's a preview of what Matt will be talking about today. Keyword research and search trends, SEO-friendly copywriting, content optimization, website and landing page optimization, content trends, analytics, and of course, we'll be answering your questions throughout. So feel free to chime in. So with that, uh, I would just like to hand the mic over for a bit here to, to Matt. So take it away, Mr. Bailey. All right. Well, thank you, Dan. And as you can tell by the agenda, it seems to be content heavy. And that is certainly uh, without an accident there that if you've been an SEO for any length of time, you can see where things are moving in the digital marketing industry towards social media, content marketing, those types of things. And so the role of the SEO is becoming more critical than ever in being that connection from what are people searching for and then what do we publish. Uh, SEO is that critical link between the research and the development of content. And that is only going to increase more and more over the next few years. So that's why there's a little bit more of emphasis on that content side that you'll see there. But just, you know, a little bit more in detail on that, that the role of SEO has primarily been as that first line of understanding what the search engine is doing, what do they require, what are the new technologies coming out of search? And what are the trends coming from search? Uh, how is Google changing the results? What are they testing? So SEOs, first and foremost, are on those front lines of seeing what, especially Google. Google is pushing the, the envelope more than anybody, and they're testing more things. And so understanding what is Google doing, what are the implications of it, uh, is this just a test or are we moving? What's the bigger picture of what they're attempting to do? And so understanding that role there of being that early predictor of what's going on with Google and then being able to translate that inside your organization or inside your agency, that is really becoming part of you know, the, the representative role of the search engine optimizer is understanding here's what's happening, and here's how we're supposed to react to it. At the very base level, it's understanding those keywords. It's understanding what are people searching for, and what is their intent, and how do we then apply that into our content strategy. So that has been really kind of the foundational part of what an SEO does, but it's also going to be a little bit larger into looking at the larger trends of what is Google attempting to do, what are the implications, and how do we respond to that. Now, of course, with part of that keyword research is understanding the long-term trends uh, over a year, two years, three years, because if something has a trend and it's predictable, well, then that's something you can bring into your organization, uh, because I, I love to say if it's predictable, it's monetizable. You can make money off it if you know that it's going to happen every year because you can prepare for it. You can help your organization prepare for those increases in traffic, especially if you're able to tie those trends into specific events. If you can come up with causality, what causes those to happen? How do we react to it? How can we develop that? And how can we incorporate that into our strategy? Again, that is more of a planning and prospecting work 
that a search engine optimizer would do and those skills of doing keyword research and understanding the long-term view of keyword research, of trends throughout the year, creating those connections, that is a valuable skill which is only going to increase. And of course, those keywords are important for anyone in a marketing field or also customer service. We've seen more and more of this cross-marketing view across an organization where marketing is getting more involved in customer service. They're getting more involved in loyalty. They're getting more involved in many different aspects of nurturing customers, the customer experience. Uh, and so whenever you're planning any of these things for social media, and what are we doing with social media? Are we educating? Are we rewarding? Are we trying to look for new customers? Well, all of that requires content. That content is going to have to be researched as to when do we talk about certain things and how do we talk about certain things. Keyword research gives you that agenda. It, keyword research tells you when people search for certain content and also the associated words that they have. And so that applies to your content marketing, your social media marketing. It also applies to when people become customers. And if you do any amount of uh, CRM marketing, email marketing, or email automation, or even triggered, your keyword research can help in developing the content that will be in those emails because you will have done the research and find out what do people want after they make a decision, after they purchase a product, what are the needs that they have, what is the information need that they have, and how do we write towards that. So again, SEO is influencing the content that is generated by the entire organization in nearly all communications. This gets back to seeing the trends that are happening within the search engine, and you've probably seen this lately. I love this example here. So if I want to make a latte, and I type that into Google, uh, this is what's interesting. The answer to my question is at the top of the page. Now, without even going to the website, I can have my answer for the question and now there's a couple implications to this. Yes, it's great. We can be at the top of the rankings. We can have our answer there. But if the answer completely answers the searcher's question, it doesn't generate a page view. They don't see much of our brand. They aren't in, really, they aren't engaging with us at all. They're engaging with Google. And so – this gets to the point of how do you then bring this to the organization as far as a strategic view of this? How do we approach it? How does this change what we do with our website or with our content? You can also see here that people are asking different questions. And this gets to the copywriting of the website. Are you generating content that answers questions? Because this is where Google is pulling this information as well as pulling the related questions that come from that type of content. This also is critical because this then leads into voice search. And so if you've got a home assistant, uh, you use any of the phone assistants, or hey, guess what? This is coming in cars, uh, that you will have a voice assistant in cars, and your search result will be read back to you. And this is the beginning stages of that that if you have a question or a search, you would speak your search, and then the first result would be read back to you. And as you can see, it's not coming from the site. It's coming from Google. So this is where, again, we sit down, we look at the strategy. What are we trying to do? What is our strategy as far as visibility in the search results? And what's going to happen and what's happening now with this is you could be answering people's questions and never knowing it. Uh, simply based because Google is delivering the result, they're not going to your site. Now, the possibility of them going to your site exists, but as more voice searches are being generated, Google is going to deliver a result that doesn't require a click-through because it's all happening through audio. 
So hopefully this uh, doesn't uh, – <laughs> all the changes in SEO, I would say, over the past uh, 15 years have been largely external, driven by Google, uh, as Google has taken away keywords, taken away uh, keywords in analytics, uh, done numerous things here that have caused SEOs to have to react. Uh, and again, this is one of those changes uh, that causes us to sit and figure out how are we going to deal with this change. So we have some questions already, one of which is sure. Google's not spending so much time focusing on keywords specifically. Even though they're still important, where do you suggest that marketers look for keywords? Oh, I think the, the typical keyword research tools are still very viable. In fact, you'll probably get uh, better information out of keyword tools than you will Google's keyword tool. Uh, Google has been combining keyword concepts under a single keyword. So, for example, um, a great one that uh, we, we've seen in the keyword research uh, pool table and pool tables, plural and singular, Google puts that all under pool table. Whereas anyone who you know, does any amount of e-commerce can tell you there is a world of difference between people that search for plural and singular. Uh, before the, the changes in keywords, I could tell you with numerous sites that we had that if people searched with the singular version, uh, they were about three to five times more likely to purchase than if they searched for the plural version. Uh, the plural version meant that they were shopping. The singular version pointed to they were ready to make a decision. So Google won't show you the data, however, between the plural and singular for pool tables. Hmm. Other keyword research tools, however, will show you that. So even though... You know, even though it's getting more difficult with the keywords, from a marketing standpoint, absolutely still do your keyword research right as if you would. Uh, you know, you're going to have to do additional research, maybe, you know, customer research, uh, you know, face to face, asking them to describe how they would search or what they were looking for, or what problem you solved, because you're going to need a wider variety of input for keywords. Yeah, and if you have any way to look into your competitors, I know there are some tools that let you let you do that. You can see what uh, your competitors are, or at least in their or their SEM, you can learn a lot. Yes, uh, by what because yeah. uh, you, you can you can tell a lot by what's a valuable keyword by learning what your competitors are paying for, and uh, also check your check your analytics to see how people are actually finding you. Uh, what's interesting is how is uh, how is rank, I know Rank Brain is one of the most influential parts of Google now. And I know that that's basically a lumping instead of creating separate pages for plurals and other iterations of words, rank brain is sort of uh, including all of that and, and looking for those words in general content. Is that, how is rank brain affecting uh, search terms and, and SEO with just keywords? Um, you know, it's, it's really trying to learn more of what exactly do people want uh, from an intentional standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, so trying to put together uh, unfamiliar searches or unfamiliar phrasings, or I, I think I read the other day, um, I'm trying to think whose name it was, but it was oh Matthew McConaughey. His name in one week had like 8,000 misspelled variations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> somehow... You know, a search engine has to figure out <laughs> over 8,000 misspellings. Who did you mean? You know, who are you trying to figure out? Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's trying to figure out the intent and deliver the right result. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, I, I think part of this is, yes, they don't want SEOs to be focusing on individual words. Um, it, and by taking away all that data, you know, in a way they have accomplished that. Uh, so, you know, what Rank Brain is attempting to do is trying to tie those things together of how do we figure out. Now, they're looking at the minutia of the differences mm -hmm. of words, uh, but they do not want to show it to us. Right. So, it's not a whole lot you can do. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's from their standpoint. The best thing you can do is just continue to write great content that people want. Mm-hmm. 
that answers their questions using a variety of using a variety of words that explain. Uh, you know, a great example is you know if you're writing an article. Uh, you know, baseball season started here in the U.S. If you're writing an article about baseball, you're going to use words like umpire, like balls, strikes, bats, teams. Those are all words that build context. And so they're going to count just as much as the primary term baseball. And in fact, Google's going to look for all those other terms that, sh that build that context. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not so much that single word anymore. It's that variety of... I would call those second tier words that support the context of what you're writing about. Those right. are coming more into play. Yeah. And and of course putting that in a in a more natural language type of uh type of phraseology in your content rather than yes. the, the old days of keywords. You know, how many keywords can we stuff in the first paragraph? Uh, uh, what's the optimum yeah. le number of words in the in the meta tag? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I mean because now it really uh, if it looks like you're, I mean, they, Google's been penalizing people for doing stuff like that for years, but now, especially with Rank Brain, it, 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 the more you can do to look, to, to write like a conversation that people are actually thinking and asking about, I'm sure, mm -hmm. is, is a better way. They've always wanted that. I mean, that has always been Google's goal. From the beginning, they have told us to write for humans. Uh, but the problem has been, it, you know, there are a lot of SEOs there that would rather take the formulaic approach. And, you know, why should I write for humans? I'm just trying to get people to my site. You know, I want to, they're going to buy. Uh, and, and so they, you know, try to reverse engineer everything to come up with this formula of use this keyword this many times in this part of the page. And, you know, whereas Google has always said write for humans first. And so by taking away some of those other options or taking away the keywords, it's really guided the industry to do what they wanted to do. And honestly, I think it's, it's a good thing because mm -hmm. the quality of content has to increase. It, it has to get better. Uh, and that is one way that they've enforced that, what, exactly what they, they've imposed their will <laughs> on, on people who desire to have better rankings. Right. The, uh, I just have one, one more question. That people, a lot of people are, are asking if you have any specific recommendations for, for keyword research tools before we, we dive wow. on to the next thing. There are a lot of them. Um, so if you've got like Raven or um, – I'm trying to think what are some of the others. Raven SEO tools – um, there's one right on the edge of my tongue. Um, word tracker still word tracker. Yeah. Um, Oh, I've got a list of them somewhere here. You could, you could <laughs> but yeah, we can put that out. <laughs> yeah. Just look, just Google out and, and look at some of the keyword research tools. Um, there are a lot of them. Many of them offer free trials. And so, yeah, just get in, do the free trial, take a look at what's there. Um, yeah, yeah. Some come with full service site management. You may not want all that. You may you may want that. Others are more standalone, independent. They just do keyword research. Never choose a keyword research tool that doesn't show up at least on page ten of the SERPs. Would be <laughs> but yeah, and and honestly, the more you do keyword research, I I have always felt this way, and it, it, the more you do keyword research the better equipped you are to do your job. Uh, and, and by that, it's dissecting the keywords. What are people looking for? What are the trends? What do they associate? What are uh, the people, places, and things? So as you're looking at the keywords, you're not so much looking to see the volume that someone searched for, you know, buy a, you know, buy a pink car. That's, that's a great, you know, that's good. But they talked about cars, they talked about buying, and they talked about color. That's more of what we're looking for is let's start slicing and dicing this down. What words are they associating? What colors? What uh, features? And by understanding the breadth of how people search and the questions they have, it helps you write better content because now you understand not just optimizing for one word. People have questions across an entire breadth of type, style, color, uh, place, uh, city, uh, you know, all these types of things. 
And so that's really what I challenge people to get out of keyword research is understanding the full breadth of what people want rather than just a single word or a single phrase. <laughs> this gets into copywriting. You see, like I said, when you, when you get into – you know, are people looking for colors? Are the people looking for locations, sizes? I want to understand the breadth of what they're talking about, and that helps me become a better copywriter. I can understand intent. If I know the questions that they have, then we can write answers. And so, you know, I want to see how people are searching. You know, a great example is is now we've seen searches increasing for people searching for you know the best. Or the top rated, or uh, Near reviews. Me, I think is yeah. a good thing too. Oh yeah, for me, uh, people are actually typing in what is the best car for me, yeah. and I think what they're doing essentially is, is is directly asking Google. You know, based on the two million things you know about me, what would be the best car for me? Um, so people are looking for more personalized information. Uh, so what you can do is get into the you know the how to, the why the you know what it means all these different cues that people are giving in their key phrases develop your content to answer those questions yeah i had actually seen a statistic that 82 percent of smartphone users use uh, and this is for businesses always looking for businesses use specifically the term near me after their search so even geographically yeah. um, i don't know if that's anything you can include in the content but uh well, no, you know, it it's, it's blows my mind because um, if they're on their smartphone, they're automatically going to get results near them. Uh, that That's kind of interesting. So it, it's more of a cue for Google than it is for a website because to use that phrase in any of your optimization really wouldn't make a lot of sense uh, because you don't know who's near you. Um, and, and if anything, especially on a mobile search, Google is pretty much going to ignore that near me because you're going to get the results near where you are anyway. Yeah, um, so yeah, getting into the search data, people search for what they need. They, they figure out what they're looking for. But now here is where the role of the SEO is going to come in organizationally, is that when you have people writing content, generating content for content marketing, for social media, uh, especially if you're working with, uh, you know, like a publisher who is constantly developing content. Now you need to help them come up with ways to measure success and also to motivate them to implement SEO tactics in their writing. So rather than uh, developing catchy headlines uh, that may have a double meaning that may not play well in search, you need to help copywriters understand that, well, your headline, while that might look great on print, in search, it's actually going to cause a problem. And so you turn into an educator for your content developers. Uh, you're, you're teaching them what works well, what's going to click well, what's going to look well in the search engines versus what might be confusing. Also, uh, it's also helping them to understand, you know, a great example of this um, before I move on, someone um, gave me a, a great example is they were writing an article about holiday time travel, and that was the title of the article that they put out there, and they couldn't figure out why this article was consistently getting hundreds or thousands of visits a month uh, well after it was published. And when we went back and started looking at some of the rankings and some of the keywords and things like that, we found out that the article was ranking really well for time travel, uh, even though the headline was holiday time travel. Uh, so it's helping your writers understand um, you, you know, what makes a good title. Uh, but then also, one thing that uh, I worked with one publisher, and one of the things we did to motivate the writers – was to develop like a, a leaderboard of whose content is generating the most visits. Uh, and not only that, whose content is generating the most new visits to the website. Uh, and then you can carry that through to, you know, for, how, for different writers, how many visits or views have you generated in a month? Or over the past six months, how much has your content uh, performed 
compared to other content. And you can carry this all the way out to uh, you know, which writers had the highest amount of ad clicks uh, mm -hmm. in their articles, uh, which articles uh, led to people to uh, – subscribe again or you know get, even get into customer lifetime value uh there's so many things that you could implement so from an seo standpoint you understand already how to look at the success of gaining rankings and what it generates in terms of page views click throughs time on site uh click depth uh you know all those types of things that you can then develop into helping others in the organization who publish content start to measure the impact of their writing organizationally, and then especially if you're able to tie that to a financial implication uh, that shows that this is what it's contributing towards the business in terms of revenue, then you become the all-around hero because you're able to help others tie revenue to activity. Mm -hmm. That's great. We have someone asking, can this backfire on you? For example, if you're starting every headline with uh, one weird tr this one weird trick, dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you find that you have a lot of, if your bounce rate immediately starts going up, yeah. because you have, cause if you're waiting for time travel or Star Wars or something uh, <laughs> that everyone's going to be looking for, um, then... Um, uh, could that actually ne negatively affect uh, how Google sees you? If it's, if you have all these bounce rates, they might see you as, uh, as oh, no longer being relevant. Absolutely. And it's not just Google with the bounce rate. It, it damages your brand. It damages your credibility. I mean, it's, it's clickbait. And, I mean, it doesn't take long for people to realize clickbait is clickbait. Um, you can just look at some of the data. Uh, but, yeah, I mean... When you see articles or headlines that are obvious clickbait, people are, you know, you get caught a couple of times, you get fooled a couple of times, it's not always going to work. And so this gets to, you know, how are you positioning your brand? Are you positioning your brand as a trustworthy source of information that answers people's questions? Are you positioning your brand as we give people what they need what they want uh, or are you fooling them to click on an article based on what's popular right now uh, you know there's a couple questions that get to how the brand wants to be perceived in the marketplace uh, based on tactics like that but great question great question because clickbait is powerful um, but you got to ask yourself are we giving people what they want or are we fooling them into it, and how will that reflect on the brand? Right. Uh, from another keyword standpoint, one thing that I found is very valuable to do is go out and look and see how people are searching for the brand and content associations they make with that brand. Uh, now, this can also get into other areas. You may find that there's some crossover uh, where there is another company with a similar brand name. Uh, and so this will help you understand a little bit more if you get some of that crossover traffic, but also from a PR standpoint, do people associate content or ideas with your brand that you would rather – this will help you become aware of something that might be out there that may not be getting picked up. Uh, so I, I enjoy doing these kinds of searches because I want to know – what other words, associations are people making with the brand right. that you may need to deal with? Yeah, and also look at your analytics and what is linked in your CRM to see uh, how people have actually converted. Because if you have some long tail keywords in there, that would be good to generate content on uh, that your best customers are finding you through. That can be super valuable and at least compensate for having some super clickbaity words in, <laughs> in, there, in there accidentally. And what's interesting is that uh, people, uh, people are, 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 a few people are really wanting to hone in on this, uh, uh, backtrack a bit here to ways to capitalize on certain things that, um, I know people are looking for quick answers to rank high on Google, uh, mm -hmm. but the, the question keeps coming up about, uh, for example, are there, are there any ways why you could t restructure your content to capitalize on things like near me like should you put in your opening paragraph you know if, if you're looking for a near uh, 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 that, that's that's almost i 
I personally would would shrink from doing that because I know yeah. that, that, that that's something that that seems that a Google. I don't want to put words in your mouth. It seems like a Google is already doing that automatically based on if you're yep. searching mobile, but two if. if Pretty soon they're going to catch up to people putting best and near me, and because mm-hmm. that's the other question. Like, should I should I use terms that are should, when I when I see the results of most commonly searched terms in mobile, should I put those in my in my copy? Uh, so, uh, what do you say about that? Like, are there ways to, that you can legitimately, without being uh, penalized, capitalize well, on? Yeah. Me the, and well, okay. If you're legitimately publishing an article that is well researched comparing different products and you title it best pet food products or something like that, that's a legitimate case. I have no problem with that. Do your homework and create something of value and it will do well if it's good content that people like. Now, the, the near me is a bit more sketchy. Because even though you may put on your website something about near you or near me, uh, not everyone who visits your website – remember, this is more of a mobile uh, phenomenon. These are people on their phone looking for something near them, a drugstore, uh, a car wash, uh, you know, something like that, a restaurant. And that's being computed based on distance, based on – uh, you know, past preferences, things like that. So it has nothing to do with the content of your website. What I would work on more is your local business listing in Google and developing more reviews for your business and working with that uh, listing to add more pictures. Like I said, reviews, uh, they have a function there now where you can add promotions. The more you develop that Google listing, that will do a hundred times more to increase your visibility when someone is looking for something near them and they are near you than adding words to your website. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, that sounds smart. <laughs> I may come across a bit forcefully on some of these things, uh, mainly because it, it's it's. It has never bothered me when people out and out try to fool Google with some really intelligent things. Uh, I, I somewhat tend to admire it. Uh, but when people try to fool Google with what I would call amateurish things that are poorly executed, that's where I, you know, that's where I get, I get a little ticked off at that. Yeah. Because it, it, it's, it create a quality experience. That's what people want. Quality experience. Uh, and, and that's really what it gets down to with, you know, we, with content marketing. You're answering people's questions. And so as people are generating that content, you're also sending them back to the site. You're sending them back to get answers, to register, to do things like that. So all those web pages from the content marketing that they're linking to, they need to be optimized for your inbound strategy. And what's interesting is also from a paid search standpoint, the landing page from paid search – you know, it needs to be optimized just like any other page. That's part of the quality score algorithm. Does the landing page reflect the paid search headline? Does it also contain the keyword that you're bidding on? So you've got to look at how people are developing their landing pages internally, and maybe you can contribute to that as well in helping improve the quality score because the optimization of that landing page is very similar. Uh, where I see employment and industry trends. Now, this is interesting because talking with the uh, director of OMCP and some of the surveys he's been doing of hiring managers, HR managers, and technology uh, or, or in marketing across the, across the, the, the globe here, uh, one of the things that he has seen is there is becoming more demand of people who can manage the entire tech marketing stack, not the single channel specialists, because more and more automation is handling that. Uh, More and more, you know, and this is where we're going to see the entrance of AI and machine learning is adjusting your paid search campaign with those minute methods of increasing your click-through rate. 
uh, you know, it's going to be managing those bids. So eventually you're just going to focus more on the content. And eventually AI is going to take over the content. Uh, so <laughs> the demand is for who were the single channel specialists of SEO, paid search, social, to move into understanding the entire omni-channel digital marketing campaign and can run and can change and can make recommendations across the board for the entire stack of digital marketing. This is where we're seeing more of the employment trends uh, going as well as the skills demand is getting away from that single hard skill to understanding the entire campaign. Uh, and that's going to go into all different types of things. That's going to include email, CRM, social, display. Uh, and SEOs, I think, are probably very well positioned in all of these things because of the foundation of keywords. The foundation of keywords and understanding intent and then developing content that answers those questions, that's needed in email, it's needed in automation, it's needed in social and display. You know, especially in the CRM automation is someone has to write the content that needs to be autom automated. And so, again, this then gets into uh, looking at the trends. Uh, because automation, you not only need to write the content, but you need to then plan the content. When is it sent? When is this completed? When is this done? Uh, and so understanding the, the sales cycles and how long they go and when people need certain information at what times, it takes that planning strategy of being able to do that. And I think SEOs are well positioned to understand that full stack of marketing and the implications as well as the management of it. And then we get to analytics. Uh, this is my favorite. Um, so as an SEO, or if you're taking on more of the, the omni-channel burden here, uh, you've got to develop those measurements that show how effective not only SEO has been, but now content management. Content management is big. Everyone is moving towards it. It has become a significant piece of strategy However, what is lacking in content management is the measurement. How do we know that this content piece that went out, whether it was a video, uh, whether it was an infographic, whether you know, regardless of what it was, number one, how do we track performance? Number two, how do we know it affected anything? Number three, what was the pathway? Where were we driving people and what did we want them to do and how successful was that? And then also from an attribution standpoint, did this lead to other things? You know, where did this content piece or where does this channel help us overall in attribution in driving new leads or nurturing people along the path? And so it's getting more than just getting, you know, measuring clicks. It's, it's measuring actual hard dollars that were generated based off specific channels or specific pieces of content. Uh, and, and then, you know, it, it's developing an understanding of sales goals. What did the sales department need uh, in terms of information to enhance the CRM so that they can nurture people along in the path? Uh, so it's more than just marketing. It's understanding that full scope that a company has. Yeah, that's a it's an excellent point, and I think another thing to keep in mind too is is use actual conversations with your salespeople. As, oh. As a, one of the few things, <laughs> it's funny that, that marketing and, and sales often are their own little silos. And yeah. uh, I, I think one of the best things a marketer can do is just go and talk to your best salespeople and ask them, what, why are people buying us? Yeah. Uh, what, what are the what are they what are the questions they are asking you to answer? Um, I think that can be a because those questions since they're legitimately people that are, that are engaging with your salespeople and making purchases, I think those are the most valuable questions you can answer in your copy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, short of talking to a customer, talking to your sales department is the best way to get information. Um, it, it, now, my, before I got into SEO, I was in sales. I took sales training and, and, and you know, dealt directly with people. So it kind of, I had that... Uh, you know, that view of things, but I, I'm amazed at how much people don't interact with their sales department in order to learn, uh, you know, what do people need? How do we answer their questions? What, you know, what do they respond to? But then also your salespeople are the first in line entering information into the CRM. 
And when leads are created through your marketing efforts, it'd be good to ask them, what additional information do you need that would make a better lead? You know, there and there are many times where we have changed the site on the recommendation of the sales team and you know, we, we may not have it we didn't improve conversions, but we what we improved were the 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 scenario through which the sales call then came after the conversion and increase the close rate just based on changing the landing page or the thank you page after the registration. Right. And it's a, it's a good conversation to start having with your sales field, too, so that they know what kind of questions to listen to. Because a lot of times they're just not paying attention. You ask a salesperson, <laughs> they, they, they made the sale because I was a great sales guy. Um, but the more you the more you work with them as a team and say that, hey, you know, to, to get them thinking about what you're l- actually listening to what the customers are asking for and passing that on to you, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that, of course, will, will help lead attribution and 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 all the things that you said. So, yeah, definitely don't forget the human element in SEO. Well, and this gets to, you know, this really gets to if if the trend now is moving more towards, you know, someone who can manage a full stack, it's also moving towards people who understand how to align sales and marketing goals. And beyond that, it's not just, you know, like the example I gave before, it's not just – Okay, we increased the conversion rate of our registration. Okay, that's great. What did, how did that contribute to revenue? But now it's understanding that there are things that we can do to increase a close rate that don't always take place on the website, but it's a process. And so now we're analyzing processes that can be done electronically, and then how do we create a better revenue stream that way? How do we make a better nurture process? Now we're getting into the effectiveness of content and producing a result rather than just you know a conversion, uh, a sale, or a lead. Now we're looking at, well, how do we make more money based out of this? Uh, and, and that's really it, – it's that big picture of understanding that you know, our job is not just to get leads. It's to create better profitability, which rewards everybody. So it's understanding those touch points from content. Uh, you know, so as content is being pushed out, does it answer the question? Does it lead people to the next stage? How quickly does it lead them there? Uh, can you measure influence from your content and, you know, through depth of visit or the depth of the page that they got to? Um, and then, again, it, it's the experience based on motivations. Can you understand that? Can you tie together what a customer was feeling at a specific point through their nurture stream uh, or through this process. As I said, it's, it's getting away from more just stuff that happens on the site. It's communications throughout the entire process, the entire life cycle of a customer that's all coming under the, the management, really, of the marketing team right now is that entire customer life cycle communication and management. Uh, and finally, this is something, a trend that I've been seeing as well in terms of uh, jobs and hiring and also business function. Uh, OMCP did a, a survey at the beginning of the year asking people where they spent the most amount of their time and specifically in SEO and SEO managers uh, and uh, anyone who dealt with SEO, nearly 40% of their time was spent uh, presenting their research, presenting strategy, as well as uh, as well as explaining their the reasoning for that strategy. And so SEOs, you need to become a lot more comfortable in front of people, uh, presenting your findings, making recommendations, presenting opportunities, trends, uh, and presenting it in a persuasive format. Uh, that shows uh, not a bunch of data charts, but shows how smart you are in creating new revenue opportunities for the company. And that is really where we see a lot of things going are the presentation skills are becoming part of the demand uh, for companies when they're dealing with tech. Thanks, guys. Now we have Rob to take us through keyword research, Google Analytics, Google Tag Manager, how you can rank number one on Google and YouTube, how to increase YouTube subscribers, how to get traffic to your website, 
some popular SEO tools, and finally, some SEO tips and tricks. Keyword research. So, what are we going to talk about when we talk about keyword research? We're going to talk about why we would do keyword research for SEO. We're going to talk about the types of keywords that we need to research. We're going to talk about some methodologies, best practices on how to do keyword research, some alternate suggestions. We're going to talk about keyword clustering, and then we're going to talk about some tools that you can use to do your keyword research. So let's start with the why we would do keyword research. So Jesse is planning to publish a blog of pizza recipes. So she was doing pizza recipes step by step, pizza recipes with sausage, homemade pizza toppings, pizza dough recipes, thin crust pizzas. She's doing a lot of different topics on pizza recipes. Well, what Jesse needs to do is understand what's going to drive traffic to these blog posts if she's writing about, you know, different topics around pizza recipes. So she's unsure how these blogs are going to drive traffic. So she really needs to understand that, hey, you need to choose the right keywords to drive traffic. So the question is, if you're writing a blog post about recipes with sausages, is pizza recipes with sausages or recipes for free the best keywords to use? Maybe, maybe not. So you need to take uh, care in choosing the keywords to align with your content. So that's really the idea of why we would do keyword research because some of the issues with keywords that are poorly chosen are they could have low search volume for example you may choose a keyword that just a lot of people aren't using to search for or they can be highly competitive so if you choose a keyword that's very broad or popular it can be very competitive and take you a long time to be found for that keyword or you could just make the mistake of choosing a keyword that isn't aligned with your content or you can choose keywords but use them incorrectly with your content so these are some of the issues that you can encounter if you just go about choosing keywords randomly without due diligence, without the proper research. So low vo search volume will lead to less traffic, high competition, you may not even rank at all, okay? If somebody finds you for a keyword that's not relevant to the topic, they're just going to leave the page. And if you're not using the right keywords and, or if you are using the right keywords and not using them correctly in the content, then your pages may not even be found in organic search. So you really have to take care in choosing the keywords. To me, that's the most important step with SEO is keywords keyword research. So we're going to talk about the types of keyword research then. So we have short tail keywords and we have long tail keywords. So if you write a blog post about pizza recipes, well, what are you going to choose a short tail or long tail? So let's talk about short tail keywords first. So short tail keywords are keywords that are usually three keywords in a phrase or shorter. In some cases, it may be two keywords in a phrase or shorter. So short tail keywords usually have high search volume volume, which means, likely means higher competition. But what it also means, it could be lower conversions. Because short tail keywords, like for example, pizza recipes, could be considered a short tail keyword. But maybe somebody's looking for homemade pizza recipes or pizza recipes from their favorite Italian restaurant. So short tail keywords may not be as relevant. So if we compare it with long tail keywords, chances are you're going to have lower competition. That's one of the benefits, but you're also going to have lower search volume. But with longer tail keywords, the keyword is probably going to be more relevant with the content you're writing about. So therefore, the conversion rate's likely going to be higher. So that's really the difference between short tail keywords and long tail keywords. If you want to look at simplistically, short tail keywords are broad in nature. It's going to capture a lot of eyeballs, but those eyeballs may look at your content as not relevant versus long tail keywords that may be very relevant, but not as many eyeballs on them. So short tail keywords, the characteristics, they're not as specific. Usually they're less than three words. They have high search volume and high competition. So if you just choose pizza recipes, could take you a while to rank for that keyword. But when you rank, you're going to get the traffic. But again, it may not convert because the keyword is broad in nature. So pizza recipes is a short tail keyword that may not be exactly 
what you're writing about in your blog post. So it may draw a lot of traffic, but the traffic may not do anything. So the longer tail keywords are very specific. They consist of more than three words in the search query. They have relatively low search volume competition. So the chance of you ranking higher, faster for that long tail keyword is probably gonna be greater because not many other websites are trying to rank for that same keyword. And so the benefit of that is if you have, let's just say homemade pizza recipes with mushrooms, that's a long tail keyword. But if somebody's looking for that type of pizza recipe, then you know you're gonna track the right traffic and chances are that traffic is going to engage or convert based on the type of conversion you have in place. So an example would be homemade pizza dough recipes. That'd be another example. More than three keywords in the phrase, very specific. We're talking about homemade pizza dough recipes. So we're not talking about just pizza recipes. So it's a little bit more uh, specific in nature, longer tail. So these keywords are used for targeted pages, including blog posts. If you're writing a blog post specifically about pizza recipes with homemade dough, then this is the keyword you likely would wanna use versus just pizza recipes. So let's look at an example between a short tail keyword and a long tail keyword. And to accentuate the differences, we're going to use Google's Keyword Planner tool. So Google's Keyword Planner tool is located in Google Ads. The Google Ads platform. And when you're in the Google Ads platform, you can simply click on tools and then keyword planner. And so what keyword planner allows us to do is get a sense of the type of volume that a particular keyword has. So what Google's keyword planner does is they show you the average monthly searches. This is the average monthly search volume of a keyword over the past 12 months. And so in this example, we're going to choose pizza recipes and homemade pizza dough recipes. So one short tail and one long tail. So we enter those keywords in, we're going to click get results. And what Google's going to do is it's going to show us the volume of those keywords. So for pizza recipe, we could see the average monthly search volume is 33,100 for pizza recipe. So note that pizza recipe and pizza recipes are closely related keywords. And so what Google does is they consider that a close variance. So meaning, and if somebody types in pizza recipe, then they're also, in Google's eyes, looking for pizza recipes. So it's a close variance. And so for the keyword pizza recipe, which is short tail, we could see on average over the past 12 months, this keyword received 33,100 queries. And so if we hover over the graph, we could see basically the volume, the average volume per month. So here I could see for this particular keyword here, the volume per Per month is 33,000 and then I could see the actual volume over the past 12 months and then for the long tail keyword I can see homemade pizza dough recipe again close variance homemade pizza dough recipes I could see over the past 12 months what the search volume is for this on average it's 2400 but I could see here in December the volume went up to 3600 but for example in May it was 1900 so it's gonna fluctuate a bit over the past 12 months, but on average is about 2,400. So shorter tail, a lot of more volume, longer tail, not as much volume, but nonetheless, there is volume here. And so these are the differences between a short tail and a longer tail. And so what Google's Keyword Planner also does is allow us to get a sense of what the competition is. And so here I can see the competition is low for both of these keywords. Fair enough. So we now know that if we want to optimize or choose the keyword homemade pizza dough recipe for our blog post, we know for ranked on page one of Google, even in the top spot, we can expect about 2,400 search queries for that keyword. Now, whether you get all 2,400 clicks for that keyword remains to be seen. Chances are you're not gonna get all 2,400. You're gonna get a lion's share of those clicks, but you're going to at least get some volume on it. So even the longer tick keywords have a lot of promise because there is some search volume here for this keyword. How to do 
a proper keyword research. So we looked at Google's keyword planner tool in Google Ads and we typed in two keywords and we were able to get a sense of what the average volume is. So we definitely want to choose keywords based on the following factors. We want to choose it based on search volume. Search volume is a good indicator of the potential traffic we can obtain. So again, for the keyword homemade pizza dough recipe, we know that it averages 2,400 a month in search volume. Again, we may not get all 2,400, but we're going to get a lion's share of that. We also need to look at competition. And so Google's keyword planner gives us a high, medium, or low in terms of the competition. But if you're somebody who wants to get a, a better sense of what the competition is, and you should, because competition is a key component in choosing keywords. And so what I want to do is get a sense of how many people are actually optimizing for that keyword. So Google's keyword planner tool is going to give me a low, medium, high. Really what I want to do is get a better sense of that numerically. So what I can do is go into Google's search and I could type in pizza recipes and I could see there's about 1 billion results. That's a lot of results. However, that means that every potential web page out there on the internet that mentions pizza recipes is going to be included in this number here. And so I want to get a better sense of who's optimizing for pizza recipes. So I'm going to put in the all in title syntax. And so what that is going to ask Google to do is tell me all the websites that have pizza recipes, the keyword pizza recipes in the title tag. So if I do all in title colon space, than pizza recipes, my result drops down to 336,000. So what that tells me is that there are 336,000 results with the keyword pizza recipes in the title tag. Now, if I wanna focus in on my other keyword, if I choose uh, my other keyword was a longer tail keyword, homemade pizza dough recipe. So if I type that keyword in, the homemade pizza dough recipe or recipes, remember close variants, and I just click enter or type the keyword in and hit my enter key, I'm gonna get 35 million results. But again, is that really an indicator of the type of competition I have? No, because every listing that mentions homemade pizza dough recipes is going to be included in the search results. So I'm gonna type in my all in title, colon, space, and then I'm gonna get a better sense of how many websites have the keyword homemade pizza dough recipes in the title tag. And I get 2,160 different results. So here I can see the first result in the title tag, homemade pizza dough recipe. Second one, homemade pizza dough recipe. So these are sites or web pages that have that keyword in the title tag. So now I have a numerical number to work with. And so the thing you have to understand about SEO, specifically about keyword research, is you need to do research on a few different keywords, not just one or two. So what we want to do is have a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is going to contain keywords that we can potentially want to optimize for, choose as keywords to optimize for SEO. And so my recommendation is you come up with a theme first. So the theme for us in this exercise is pizza recipes. And so that's our theme. So we chose the keyword pizza recipes. So the close variance here is pizza recipe. What was the volume? Well, we know the volume was 33,100 for pizza recipe. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna put that number in, in our volume column. What was the competition? Well, if we go back and type in pizza recipes, it was 683,000. So I'm gonna type in 683,000. What was our next keyword? Well, it was pizza or homemade pizza dough recipes. So if I go back for this particular keyword is 2400. So I'm gonna put 2400 in under my volume column. And then what was my competition? Well, my competition was, I type that keyword back in, 2160. So I'm gonna put 2160. So now I have an idea of what kind of volume and what kind of competition I have. Now, you wanna do this for a number of different keywords. And when you do it for a number of keywords, what you do want to do is obviously choose a 
relevant keyword that has high volume and low competition. So another way of saying it is the volume or ratio of volume to competition. And so basically what we could do is take volume divided by competition. And if I make that a percentage, I could see it's 0.35% is the ratio between volume and competition. If I do the same for my longer tail keyword, 2400 divided by 2160, I can see that 111%. So this just kind of proves the point that, yeah, I'm still gonna get some volume, but I have a better chance of ranking for this longer tail keyword, homemade pizza dough recipes. So you wanna be able to do that for a number of keywords and examine the volume, the competition, and the ratio between volume and competition for your themed keywords. In this case, pizza recipes. So relevancy, you wanna choose keywords that are very relevant to the content that you're writing. And then again, commercial intent, what keywords are gonna drive more conversions and revenue for the business? So when we talk about commercial intent, we're talking about, you know, are you choosing keywords that are going to get somebody to do what you want them to do? So we could say, you know, download pizza dough recipes. So if somebody's typing in the keyword, download pizza dough recipes, then chances are they're gonna find you, come to your site and take action by downloading that pizza dough recipe. So you wanna be able to also think about the intent of the keyword. Is it gonna help you drive conversions and revenue if you're an e-commerce site? So search volume is the average monthly search volume made for a particular keyword and phrase. So we can get that number using Google's keyword planner tool in the Google Ads platform. We wanna target keywords with high search volume that will help bring traffic to the website. We want volume, but we wanna take into account seasonality as well. So that's where the Google's Keyword Planner tool comes in place because if we go back, again, we can just hover over and we can get a sense of any particular trend going on or seasonality. So for example, if I saw large growth in the winter months and not much volume growth in the summer months, then that might indicate to me that this keyword is more popular during the winter time. So pay attention to the graphs that you know the Keyword Planner tool gives you. Use them to your advantage to take into account seasonality. So a good example would be funny Halloween costumes. Well, we know that for Halloween, you're going to have a spike probably towards the end of September, all the way through October, and then it's going to drop after October 31st, which is Halloween. So that's an example. But in the case of pizza recipes, you know, you may find that more people are, are choosing to search for pizza recipes during maybe the summer months versus the winter months. So pay attention to seasonality. It will affect search volume. So competition, based on our example, it's one of the most important key metrics. You don't wanna choose a keyword that's highly competitive because if it's competitive, then it's going to be harder to rank number one or even on page one of Google, depending on competitive it is. So high search volume, low competition. In other words, the ratio between the two is the ideal combination. So going back to the spreadsheet, recommend you have that spreadsheet handy. Put your theme in place, okay? Theme pizza recipes. We use Google's keyword planner tool to find the volume. We use the all in title syntax to find the competition. So we entered both of those numbers in and we get our ratio. And so when you have these numbers for a number of different keywords, you wanna be able to choose that ratio of high volume, low competition, but always, relevancy always trumps ratio. So always go with a keyword that is gonna be relevant to your content. Don't choose a keyword that's not relevant. If you choose a keyword that's not relevant, it's not going to bode well for user engagement. So the difficulty of a keyword ranges from zero to 100 in Google's keyword tool. So it's going to be easy, it's going to be medium, it's going to be hard. But my recommendation is also to get the numerical factor and that's the all in title syntax. And again, relevancy is what drives the traffic to your website and keep the traffic there on your website. And also not only will it keep the traffic on your website, but hopefully get that traffic to engage and convert. So that's the key about relevancy. You always want to choose keywords that are relevant to your content, even if it's sacrificing volume. Relevancy, again, 
relevant trumps volume in competition. So always choose relevant keywords first. So when you do that, you're always almost guaranteeing that at some point somebody's going to find your content because somebody out there might be looking for it. And if they do, you're going to get found and then the engagement's going to be better. So understand your business, find keywords that are relevant to your business, and then focus on those keywords. That'll help you with getting the right traffic to your site. Always keep in mind the commercial intent so these keywords are more specific and result in conversion rate. For example, buying is a good commercial intent keyword. So if you really want somebody to come to your website and buy, then focus on those types of keywords. In the case of the pizza recipes, maybe it's download could be our commercial intent keyword. Again, there may be low search volume, but those are the type of keywords you want to focus on because that's the type of traffic you want to drive to your site. So some other examples of commercial intent keywords are discount, deal, your coupon, shipping. You don't, don't be afraid to use some of these keywords as part of your longer tail keyword phrase. Again, the volume may not be high, but the traffic quality is probably going to be better. So keyword research is the foundation for SEO. So if you have chosen your keywords properly, then if you do get ranked for those keywords, then it's going to lead to better engagement with some conversions. And so when we talk about keywords, we also want to talk about our primary and secondary keywords. So every page should have at least a primary keyword and then a secondary keyword to work with. So primary keywords are really defining the nature of your content. The secondary keywords are relevant to the primary keyword. So why do we choose a primary and secondary keyword? because you may choose a keyword as a primary keyword that is relevant to the content but may not necessarily rank very high or have a lot of volume. That secondary keyword is also relevant to the primary keyword but also relevant to the content and you may rank for that secondary keyword. So you always want to go with two keywords versus just one keyword. You want to give your, yourself a chance to rank for at least two different types of keywords of relevant nature. So for a web page there can be several secondary keywords but only one primary keyword so your primary keyword is always going to be relevant to the, your content secondary keywords can be relevant to the keyword but and you may have multiple secondary keywords but it's also going to be related to the content and it gives you a better opportunity to be found between both the primary and secondary in search. Okay, so let's take a look at another example of how to use primary keywords and secondary keywords when choosing keywords. So if our primary keyword is healthy diet plan, remember healthy diet plan is directly related to the content. So that's what we're talking about. But these secondary keywords are also related to content and play off the primary keyword. And so what we want to do is go to Google's Keyword Planner tool and get an idea of the volume for healthy diet plan and then also the volume and competition for some of these secondary keywords like healthy diet for weight loss, healthy diet food, low carb diet, healthy meal plans, and diet plan weight loss. So if I go in to Google's Keyword Planner and type those keywords in, I'm going to choose get results. And now here I could see healthy diet plan keyword on focusing on as my primary keyword has an average monthly search volume of 9,900. And then some of my secondary keywords, healthy diet foods, diet plan, weight loss, low carb diet, you know, Google will give me a number of different keywords to work with. So I'm going to look at the search volume of those as well. And so ideally what I want to do is be able to then look at the volume and then look at the competition. So healthy diet plan, I go into my keyword analysis here. That's my theme. So that's my keyword. What's my volume for healthy diet plan? 9,900. What's my competition? So my competition is 74,700. And that's going to give me a ratio of volume to competition of 13%. So that's what my content's about. That's a considered a short tail keyword because it has a lot of competition. And so my ratio is 13%. And what I want to do is I want to be able to put these other secondary keywords in here as well. 
maybe even go a little longer tail because I want to be able to find two key, or at least two keywords. I want to be able to find my primary keyword that's relevant to my content. And then I want to be able to find my secondary keyword, which is again related to the primary keyword, which is also related to the content. And so I want to be able to choose two keywords basically. And I want to choose two keywords that are relevant that have good ratio between volume and competition. So that's the whole idea again of how to do keyword research research you, you want to be able to find your keywords use the tools available to you and get a sense of what the volume is what the competition is look at the ratio between the volume and competition and then based on the content choose that primary keyword and then again, based on the keyword you chose, choose some secondary keywords as well, because you want to be found for not just one keyword, but multiple keywords. Okay, let's look at some alternative suggestions to keyword research. So for doing keyword research, we want to take into account LSI keywords. We could take into account other platforms that host a lot of content like Quora or Reddit. We can use Google suggestions in the keyword search bar. We can use popular platforms like Wikipedia and we can use social media bookmarking like Reddit. So there are lots of suggestions that we can obtain from various sources. So let's start with LSI keywords and LSI stands for latent semantic insect indexing. And so basically what it is, it's just keywords that are linked to your primary keyword. And so when you're choosing keywords, you always want to choose that primary keyword and then secondary keywords that are similar to the primary keyword and usually those are LSI or latent semantic indexing type keywords so they're used to drive relevant traffic to your page so if you're focusing on one keyword we want to have other keywords that are similar to increase our visibility on the search engine result pages so we could find latent semantic indexing right in search so if we use the term healthy diet if we go to Google search for example if I type in healthy diet in Google search all I need to do is scroll to the bottom of the page and I can see searches related to healthy diet so healthy diet menu healthy diet essay what does a healthy diet look like notice at the top Google's also giving me some other suggestions here so they're saying low-fat diet veganism gluten-free diet so there's lots of different suggestions right in Google search bar so all of these are LSI related keywords so if you're optimizing a page for healthy diet Diet, then you could choose low fat diet as a secondary keyword. You can use gluten free diet as a secondary keyword. It really depends on what the content is, but you always want to support your content with as much LSI keywords as possible so you can be found for as many different keywords as possible in Google search. So it's important because if you have a blog that, you know, talks about Python, so how do the search engines know if the website Python is about the programming language? language or the snake so Google for example uses LSI keywords to understand what the page is specifically focusing on so if you're just focusing on Python and your content you want to support that with LSI keywords and so that will allow your web page to better communicate with Google also to have the visibility to show up on search so they can certainly improve your search positioning and featured snippets as well so if you have a keyword that answers a question you could certainly be found for a featured snippet. For example, maybe, you know, healthy diet recipes. If I type that in, you could see here, there's a featured snippet. So if I'm talking about recipes, that's a keyword I may want to use. And if I use that, then Google has an opportunity to see what my content's about and place my information at the top in this featured snippet. You can also, again, see what some of the questions are being asked, what meals are good for weight loss, what is a good healthy diet plan. All of these can be keyword phrases that you can use. So the answers are right here in Google. So Quora is a great platform because Quora is a platform that people go and ask questions in a community responds with answers or responses. 
to that particular question or topic. And so the great thing about Quora is it's a good is a good place for you to go to get some ideas about a specific topic. So if we're talking about healthy dieting, so we can find keywords with high search volume right in Quora. So the whole idea is you can look at you know the top five questions for a specific topic like healthy dieting and find relevant keywords to healthy dieting. So if you just type in that particular keyword in Quora, you're gonna probably get some responses to questions or responses to somebody else's question. And so if we take a look at Quora, for example, so if I just type in healthy dieting, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get some responses to the, the topic healthy dieting. So what's the best diet for healthy living? What are the top five tips for a healthy diet habit? So all of these could be keyword phrases that you could take away with for your own content. And so the benefit here is you're getting kind of an idea of what's trending, what people are talking about, and if you use tips for a healthy diet habit, for example, and you optimize for that, well, again, that could turn around and bode well for you because you could be featured in Google as a featured snippet at the top here. You can also turn around and use LSI related keywords for healthy diet habits. And you can simply just look for those LSI keywords right in Google. Remember at the bottom or at the top. If I scroll down, I could see some related LSI keywords at the bottom. So right in Google is as well, you could see in the Google search bar that Google provides some LSI related keywords to your query. So if I go back here and type in healthy diet recipes, I could see here Google suggesting some other related keywords. Healthy diet menu, healthy diet for men, healthy diet foods, healthy diet for women. So these are all LSI related keywords that you can use to support your primary keyword and the content you're writing about. So we've talked about LSI keywords, where to find them. So they're found right here. They can be found at the top of Google and they can be found at the bottom. You can also then go to Core as well and get some ideas for the types of questions that are being asked. So if you ask a question and use that as your keyword phrase, then again, you have an opportunity of showing up for a featured snippet in Google just by doing some additional research within Google itself or on Quora. So according to Google, the autocomplete predictions are automatically generated by Google's algorithm algorithm without any human intervention. It's based on a number of factors, but the primary factor is how often past users have searched for a term. So Google collects all the keyword queries that somebody types in, and they're suggesting some of the most popular terms that people have typed in. So if I go back to Google, again, if I start to type in recipes, I could see some of the other queries that somebody else has typed in or some of the most popular queries related to that topic. So if you enter the keyword healthy diet, Google's going to suggest multiple keyword suggestions that users have asked in the past. And you could certainly get the search volume of those keywords just by looking in Google itself. I could see for healthy diet recipes, billions of pages related to healthy diet recipes. I can also get the search volume by going into Google's keywords planner. So if I type in healthy diet, I'm going to be able to see what my search volume is for that keyword. And in addition, I can see the seasonality of that particular keyword. And in addition to that, Google is going to provide some other related keywords to my search query. So if I'm looking for healthy diet, Google is going to suggest, hey, maybe you should choose healthy food or healthy eating or how to lose weight. So those are all LSI related keywords that Google provides in the keyword plan which is built into the Google Ads platform. Another option for you is Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a vast platform of content. So we could turn Wikipedia into our own asset and use it to our own advantage by finding relevant keywords in an easy fashion. So with Wikipedia, we can identify a list of keywords in the meta description itself. We could choose keywords from the first paragraph of Wikipedia that has many relevant keywords, or we could take a look at keywords from the Wikipedia content section. So we can also see additional pages like the see also section that gives relevant keywords that you're looking for. We can also look at the references section as they contain relevant keywords. So if we go to Wikipedia as an example and I type in healthy diet into Wikipedia. Here I can get it just in the first paragraph alone. I can see some additional keywords that I might 
choose to use, like micronutrients. I never knew that micronutrients was related to healthy diet, but Wikipedia is providing some information about what micronutrients is. And maybe I can use that as a keyword, an LSI related keyword to my content. So if I scroll down, I get the see also section. So that might give me some information, food information to consumers, for example, dietary guidelines. I can look at categories like dietetics and diets. I can also look at the references section so I can also see what information was provided like health effects of overweight and obesity. I can look at diet and physical activity. So all of these are related to my main keyword healthy diet. So the answers are right in here on the platform. They're just all over the page. So Wikipedia has an abundance of information. You just need to know where to look. So again, with Wikipedia, you can look no further than the first paragraph. You can look no further than the see also section, the references section, category section. There's lots of information right on the page itself to help you get ideas for keywords. So if you Google your keyword with Wikipedia term in the search query and get relevant keywords from the title tags in the SERP. So you can also do that as well. So if I type in healthy diet Wikipedia in search, I can also get some information here as well. So people also search for healthy food advantages or healthy food habits essay or information about healthy food. All of these are related to my keyword healthy diet. So again, another bit of information for you to choose or look to choose some additional keywords for. So Reddit, it's a popular community where people post content and discuss a variety of topics. So that's what Reddit is. So with the help of subreddits, an individual can find relevant keywords with, with high search volume. So in Reddit, there's an easy way to find out keywords. They have a keyword tool called Keywordit. So Keywordit gives the average monthly searches for a particular keyword. So if we type a word in Keyreddit and choose keywords from the auto-generated list, this tool will extract the keywords and give us those relevant terms with search volume. So if we go to the Keywordit and show an example of that, for example, healthy food, if I get keywords, I can see what keywords are relevant and the search volume of that keyword. So if I just type in healthy food, Keywordit tool is going to tell me some relevant keywords and what the volume is. So if you don't have the keyword planner tool in Google Ads available to you, this is a good alternative solution to finding keywords. So it's free. You just need to go to keyword.com, type in your keyword, click get keywords, and what it's gonna do is give you some relevant keywords related to your primary keyword with the search volume. Let's talk about keyword clustering now. So the whole idea about keyword clustering is to really take advantage of the keywords that we're optimizing for to gain higher ranking. So if we can cluster keywords together in a theme, and that theme of keywords is relevant to a specific page of a website, then we have a better opportunity to rank. So in other words, why do we have to target just one keyword when we can target many? So keep in mind, you know, LSI keywords, we want to group a bunch of keywords together that are similar for content. So for example, after some keyword research, you can thematically group keywords into a core topic. So for example, we can cluster these group of keywords together. Like for example, what is SEO? How does SEO work? Intro to SEO, what are the basics of SEO? All of those are related Related to the core theme, what is SEO? Another cluster of keywords, for example, could be SEO techniques, SEO best practices, tips and tricks, website optimization, on-page SEO techniques, etc. So those are clusters of keywords, okay, that we can group together in themes. And if we group keywords together in themes, we can apply that to a particular content on our website. So the whole idea behind clustering keywords, it's going to provide more more diversity, more of an opportunity for us to be found. So that's the whole idea behind clustering. So some ad additional steps. Remember, stay up to date on industry news. So brainstorm your ideas first and identify a list of keywords, i.e. a theme of keywords that you can cluster together. And then you could determine the keywords that your competitors are already ranking for. So for example, if we want to rank for the keyword SEO best practices, for example, we can use a tool called Keyword Moz. If I go to keyword, the Keyword Explorer tool in Moz and just type in SEO best practices, 
what it's going to do is it's going to give me some volume related to that particular keyword. But more importantly, what it's also going to do is it's going to show me what pages are already ranked for that particular keyword. So therefore I can get a sense of who is already ranking for that keyword. So here I can see Moz, Moz, Medium.com, Alexa.com. So I can get a sense of what web pages are ranked for a particular keyword or group of keywords I want to rank for myself. So if we look at tools for keyword research, look no further than Moz. That's the Moz of the tool I would just use, but you could also use Google's Keyword Planner, which we used in the example. So for example, if I go back to the Google Ads Keyword Planner, if you're in Google Ads, you click on Tools, you click on Keyword Planner. And what Keyword Planner does is it provides you, for a particular keyword, the average monthly search volume over the past 12 months. It provides you information on seasonality. So if I hover my mouse over a graph, I'm going to be able to see the volume per month over the last 12 months. What the Keyword Planner also does is it provides me some additional ideas is for my particular keyword. And in addition to that, it's gonna provide me some sense of how competitive that keyword is by telling me whether it's low, medium, or high in terms of competition. So there's SEMrush, there's also other additional keywords tools out there like WordStream or Href or the Reddit tool, Keyword It. And then Moz is, a, is another tool I particularly use. So if I go to Moz again, here I can just type in a keyword that I'm interested in. It's gonna give me the search volume of that keyword. It's going to give me the level of difficulty. So 50 out of 100. So it's halfway between difficulty and easy. And then it's going to give me some additional metrics. Like for example, what my expected organic click through rate would be if I were to rank for this keyword. But more importantly, what I like about this is we could see exactly what other sites are linked to this particular keyword we're interested in. So here I can look at the top 10 list. So this is Moz's Keyword Explorer tool. So that's what this tool is, and it's part of moz.com. So there's a lot of tools at your disposal. I particularly use Moz. I particularly use Google's Keyword Planner. And those are the tools I use, but there are lots of tools out there. Google Analytics. I'm very excited to be with you today because Google Analytics is one of my favorite Google platforms and my favorite topics. So let's talk about what we're going to cover today. And we're going to start out with how to set up a Google Analytics account. And so we're going to talk about everything that entails, including creating your Google Analytics account. We're going to talk about setting up a property in your account and what a property is. We're going to talk about setting up a reporting view in your property. And we're going to talk about installing the tracking code. So those are the series of steps we're going to go through today in terms of setting up a Google Analytics account. So let's get right to it. And so really the one prerequisite here when it comes to setting up a Google Analytics account is to have a Google login and ID. So when you actually go to Google Analytics, you need to be able to sign up or sign in. And so once you actually sign in, then you're going to go walk through a series of steps. But really, that's really all you need to get the account going is a Google ID and login. So if you have a Gmail account or an other email account that you use for other Google products, then you're good to go. That's all you need to do. So when you actually go to sign up for Google Analytics, you're gonna be asked to set up a new account. And these are the series of steps you're gonna walk through or go through to set up a new Google Analytics account. So you're gonna choose an account name and then you're gonna choose a property name. Okay, so the account name can be anything you want it to be, the name of your company, your name, whatever you wanna name it. The property name is really the website name. So what website are we talking about? So here I'm gonna set up a fictitious website name for now. It's called Demo Simply Learn. So the URL for this website, Demo Simply Learn, is gonna be demo.simplylearn.com. So that's the property. When we talk about properties in analytics, we're really talking about what websites we wanna measure. 
And then you're going to be asked to choose an industry category. And so for Simply Learn, we're in jobs and education. But you have a number of different industries that you could choose from. It's as important, go ahead and choose the most relevant industry that your particular business is associated with. Okay, and I'm going to talk about why that's important here in a minute. And then you're going to choose your time zone. And the time zone is also important because that's when the day starts in analytics and the day ends based on that time zone. So the data that Google Analytics collects starts and ends with that time zone. So very important to choose the time zone your business is located in. Okay, and then you have some additional options here. Okay, so you have some settings. And so the first setting is to allow Google products and services. So if you opt into this, then basically what Google's going to do is share some products and services with you via email. I would go ahead and opt into that. That's of course recommended by Google. It doesn't hurt to hear from Google on related products and services that may enhance your business. The second is benchmarking. So benchmarking to me is something you should opt into. So going back to that industry and category, we chose jobs and education. So by opting into benchmarking, basically what Google's going to do is share your data that it collects on your website site, in this case, demo.simplylearn.com, it's going to share that data anonymously with others in the industry, in this case, jobs and education. And because you've opted in, it's going to do the same exact thing for you. It's going to share anonymous data on other websites in the same industry. And the benefit of that is we get to see what other websites or how other websites are performing compared to ours. What's the benchmark in our industry? And so the benchmarking to me is important. And I'm going to go over that in a few minutes when we go over the different reports. But to me, I would always opt into benchmarking because this is the only report Google provides in analytics about how others in your industries performing versus your website okay so it's a way to compare your website performance against others in the same industry the other options here technical support and account specialist I would also recommend you opt into those because then it allows you to basically Google allow Google access to your account and they'll be able to help you if you occur or run into any issues so these are the options in setting up a Google Analytics account. It's very simple, very easy to do. You're just entering in a few fields. Note that we talking about a website right now, so I'm talking about demo.simplylearn.com, but just know that if you wanna track a mobile app, Google Analytics will allow you to do that as well. You just choose the option mobile app. So we're tracking a website, we wanna know how users behave when they get to my website. And that's what Google Analytics is going to allow us to measure and look at. We just need to do a couple more steps in the process. So once we fill out these fields here, we're gonna click Get Tracking ID. Now, I'm going to accept the terms of service. I'm going to accept another terms of service in relation to data protection. I'm gonna click Accept. Once I accept, I'm gonna be able to get some tracking code. The tracking ID is the ID associated with your account. And so this number is going to be associated with your account. So your account ID starts with UA and it's gonna be this number here. Now the dash one is the property you set up. So in this case, I set up demo.simplylearn.com. If I wanted to track multiple websites under that same account, then I can certainly set up multiple properties. Just know that every property I set up in that account is going to have a dash one, dash two, dash three, dash four, et cetera, depending on how many properties I set up. So by default, I set up one property. So my first property ID is dash one. If I set up a second property, the same account number, it's just gonna have a dash two. And that's important because that ID, that account and property ID is going to be associated with that particular property or website. So again, once you finish setting up the account settings, then you're gonna be asked to add some tracking code to your site. And that tracking code is gonna be related to the account and the property. So notice my tracking ID up here. 
notice the tracking ID and the snippet of code. Now, this snippet of code needs to go on every page of your website that you want to track. And you don't have to put it on every page, but if you want to track website behavior on every page of your website, then it needs to go on every page of your website. So if you're using a you know platform like Drupal or Joomla or even more popular platform like WordPress, adding the tracking code site-wide is as easy as maybe adding a Google Analytics plugin in to WordPress, for example, and then just simply plugging in the ID. Now, there's an alternative to adding the Google Analytics tracking code to your site, and that's Google Tag Manager. So Google Tag Manager is the way I would recommend going. So if you're not familiar with Google Tag Manager, I would recommend watching the YouTube video we have on Google Tag Manager. You can just go to YouTube, type in Simply Learn Google Tag Manager, and this will give you a nice overview of you know, what Google Tag Manager is and how it works. But basically, this is the way I would go, and I would recommend that in addition to having Google Analytics, you set up a Google Tag Manager account. And then that way, you can put the tracking code in Google Tag Manager. So if I go to Google Tag Manager, and I just go into an account on Tag Manager, I can just simply put in the Google Analytics ID right into Tag Manager. And so if I have it in Tag Manager, then Tag Manager is going to be the place that holds the code and fires page view when somebody comes to my website. So that way I don't have to add the tracking code to my website if I do it in Tag Manager. So that's the recommended method for me is to add the Google Analytics ID associated with Tag Manager. If you can associate it with Tag Manager, then that's the easier route to go versus putting code on your website. Okay, so again, take a look at the video we have on YouTube for Google Tag Manager. That's the route I would go. Now, once you do get the tracking code on your website, whether that be through Google Tag Manager or through a plugin or you know just simply adding the script to your site, to pages on your site, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna start collecting data. So that's ideally the way it works. You need to add this code to your website. Now, if you're not ready to do that and you simply want to basically understand how Google Analytics works, then I would recommend getting access to Google Analytics demo account. And so if you just type in and search Google Analytics demo account, basically what you're gonna do, is you're gonna choose the first listing there and you're gonna go to demo account. So if you have a Google Analytics or Google login, then all you need to do is click on access demo account. And so what Google's gonna do is put this demo account into your account. And so it's gonna look something like this. So if I click on demo account here, it's going to add to my Google Analytics account. So I'm gonna have then access to the demo account from Google in Google Analytics. So I would recommend going this route here if you're not familiar, you're not sure what you're getting yourself into. So think of the demo account as kind of a test drive. You're test driving Google Analytics before you even add any code to your website. So again, all you need is a Google account. And if you have a Google account, and you add the demo account to your Google Analytics account, you're gonna be able to see how analytics works, okay? And so that's what I would also recommend. So if you're not ready to start adding code to your website, then what you can do is just simply add the demo account. And then once you add the demo account, you're free to peruse around Google Analytics to see the different types of reports it has to offer. Now, when you do actually set up a Google Analytics account, you're gonna have some settings that you're gonna to want to pay attention to. So when you set up the account, you have the account name and then you have a property. So under each property you have by default, you're gonna have one view. And so here you can see this view here. So if we look at the account we set up, we set up a demo simply learn account. Property is demo simply learn. So that's associated with the website we're gonna track. And then again, by default, under each property, you're gonna have a view. And so by default, the name of the view is gonna be called all website data. And so in that view, is where all your analytics data is going to be stored. So you can see my screen here, there's a lot of different settings you have. 
you have settings under the account, you have settings under the property, and you have settings under the view. So we're gonna talk more about these settings in future webinars for advanced Google Analytics users. But for now, know that there's a bunch of settings that you have that you can play around with when it comes to Google Analytics. Anything from adding users to your Google Analytics account, your Google Analytics property or view, you can actually set up goals, you can set up filters, you can set up segments, you can link up Google Ads, you can you know, set up remarketing list. There's a lot you can do in terms of the settings as it relates to Google Analytics. But so know those settings are there. They're located right down here in this little sprocket icon. That's the admin icon. So if you need to get to these settings at any time, you could simply just click on the sprocket or the admin icon, and then you'll be prompted to choose any one of these settings here that you want to edit or alter. So now let's take a look at some Google Analytics reports. So once you've actually set up your account, you have a number of different reports that you have available to you in Google Analytics. So we're going to take a look at, you know, customized reports. We're going to look at real time audience reports, acquisition, behavior, and conversion. So these are all the different reporting buckets, if you will, that you have available to you in Google Analytics. So if I'm an admin and I'm looking at the Google demo account, Let's start out by looking at real time. So if I click on the real time report and I just click on overview. So basically what this is going to do is show me at this point in time, how many users I actually have active on the website. Okay, so that's why they call it real time reporting because it allows you to see the behavior of users who are currently on your website. And so this is the overview report under real time. And you can see here, I can see that 79% of my users are coming from desktop, 18%, 20% are coming from mobile, and then approximately 3% are coming from tablet. Here I can see how they actually came to the website. So this is the referring source. If they came from, say, search or social, I can see the source there and I can see what pages they're active on. And then here I can see what locations, where they're located. And so if I wanna see a breakdown of everything in the overview, I can certainly do that. If I go to locations under real time, I can see a majority of my users are coming from the United States. Okay, where are they coming from? I'll just click on traffic sources. And here I could see the different sources and mediums. Medium is the means in which the traffic was driven. So if it's Google, it's either paid search or organic search. So I can see here it's organic. Then I can actually see what content they're looking at on my website. So I can see currently I have three active users on the home page, two active users on the Google's Women's White Tea page, so forth and so on. Now, most importantly, if you have event tracking set up, so if you've taken a look at our Google Tag Manager webinar, you know that you could set up event tracking in Google Analytics to measure engagement on your website, whether that be a form submission or somebody clicking on the play button of a video. So if I click on events, I'll be able to see what events are firing. So here I can see we have event tracking set up and I can see how many different events are firing on my website in real time. So here I can see e-commerce, somebody clicking on the quick view click, some you know, couple of users clicking on add to cart, a couple of users clicking on the promotion click. And as these events are fired, you're gonna be able to see them highlighted. So if something gets fired, it's gonna get highlighted. And I could see that these are the current events that I have currently firing on the website. And that's what's currently firing now. If I wanna look at the events that have happened in the last 30 minutes, I could just click on this link here, last 30 minutes, and it's gonna give me an overview of the events that have happened over the past 30 minutes. Okay, so that's event tracking. And then more importantly, we can also look at what conversions are happening in real time just by clicking on conversions. And so now I can see I had one active user who entered the checkout. So that's goal number four. So in analytics, you can have up to 20 goals. And so here I can see we have goal number four has already had one active user. And so if I look at the last 30 minutes, 
I can see I still have only one goal over the last 30 minutes, and that was somebody who entered the checkout. So that's real-time reporting. In summary, it just gives you an idea of what's currently happening on your website. And so for me, ideally, if I'm launching a campaign, or let's just say you do a new website redesign, and you wanna see how users performing and behaving, then real time's a good option for you. So you can see how things are happening in real time. Now let's jump down to audience reporting. So if I click on audience, which is just right underneath real time, I'm gonna see a number of different reports available to me under audience. And so let's click on the audience overview report. So audience reporting basically allows us to get a sense of who is coming to our website. When I say who is coming to our website, it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific person. In fact, Google doesn't allow personally identifiable information in Google Analytics. Personal identifiable information such as a specific name, a social security number, credit card information, etc. However, we could still paint a nice picture on who is coming to our website, meaning what country, city or state did they come from? What language? What device did they get to our website from? How old were they? Okay, were they male or female or other? What interest did they have? What browser did they use? So we can paint a nice picture based on all this information that Google Analytics is providing us under audience. So if I go to audience overview, here I can see I have all these different options available to me to get a basic understanding of who is coming to our website. So for example, I could see a majority of the people coming to our website speak English and are from the United States. Okay, in fact, that represents 61% of the users. And so Google Analytics does a great job of giving me an overall percentage. So if I have 100% of the users, I could see 61% of those users represented English speaking users from the United States. 7% represented English speaking users from Great Britain. And so when it comes to analytics, we have users and users are broken down into two categories. They're either returning or they're new. So when you add the Google Analytics tracking script to your website, what's gonna happen is if a user or when a user goes to your website, they're gonna get cookied. And if it's the first time they've been to your website, what Google Analytics is going to do is store a cookie in the browser. So when that same user comes back another day in the same browser, Analytics is gonna recognize that that cookie is in the browser. And so then Analytics is gonna categorize that user as a returning user, okay? So that's how Analytics is able to differentiate new versus returning. So if that user doesn't have a cookie in the browser, then Analytics is gonna recognize that, store the cookie, and then count that user as a new user. And so when you're looking in Analytics, you're gonna be able to see a breakdown of new versus returning. So here I can see over three quarters of my traffic over the past week, here I can see April 6th through April 12th, three, over three quarters are new users to the website. Here I could see about 23, 24% are returning users. Okay, so I can get a good breakdown of what type of users are coming. Am I driving new traffic? Am I driving traffic that's been to my website before? What language are they speaking? Okay, I can also paint a bigger picture. How old are they? Are they, what gender are they? Do they come from mobile? So let's take a look at some of these different reports under audience. And so if I skip down now to demographics, I can click on overview. And when that report loads, I can see now under demographics overview, I can see the breakout of age ranges. And so here I can see the majority of the traffic coming to my site again over the past week. Now, if I wanna change this date range, I could simply do that. I can change the date range just by clicking on the date range and then maybe going, say the last 30 days. And I can even compare it to the previous period or the previous year. I'm gonna choose the last 30 days. I'm gonna click apply. Now I'm looking at data over the last 30 days. And again, you can change the date range to any range you want. You can only go back as far as when you actually created the Google Analytics account. You can't go prior to that. So here I'm looking at the last 30 days and I can see almost 
47% of my users were in the age range of 25 to 34. Now, when it comes to gender, I can see 66% represent males. So I can get a breakout of gender and age as well as interest. I can click on interest and look at the overview there and see what the interest is of the users who are coming to my site based on in-market segments or affinity. I can also choose language and location. So if I wanna know exactly where my users are located when they're coming to my website, I can click on location. And here I can get a breakout 43% of the users of the last 30 days were from the United States. More importantly, I can align my audience with goals. And we'll talk about goals here in a minute, but here I can see if I have an e-commerce website, I can see of those 43%, 0.29% of those converted or purchased something. And that equates to 94 transactions. So I can get a good sense of not only how many users are coming from a specific country, but are those users converting? If I click on mobile, and mobile to me is one of those reports I tend to spend a bit of time on because I want to know what devices users are coming to my website. And so for my website here, or this is the Google demo website, I can see mobile represents approximately 27% of the traffic. So desktop still represents a majority of the traffic. So for you, you wanna keep an eye on mobile because mobile is definitely a majority of what people use nowadays. That's how people start their day. That's how they transact via mobile, whether that's purchasing something, communicating, or searching. It all starts with mobile. So you wanna keep an eye on mobile, and more importantly, you wanna keep an eye on behavior. So Google Analytics is telling me that, yes, I have approximately 27% of my traffic of the last 30 days came from mobile. How are they interacting with my website? So if I look across this report, I'm gonna be able to see different metrics. So if I'm measuring specific metrics against my dimension, in this case, the dimension is what we're measuring, and in this example, we're measuring mobile, I can see that the bounce rate is approximately 48%. And bounce rate means that if a user, in this case from mobile, landed on a page, they left the site without going any further. So they consider it a bounce. If they don't go to another page, if they leave the site from the page they landed on and they don't go any further, that's considered a bounce. So a bounce rate is the percentage of people who come to the site and leave the site without going any further. So in this case, we have 48% bounce rate. That's almost half of our users who come from mobile leave the website from the page they landed on. So is that good? Is that bad? Well, it's open to interpretation. It's definitely subjective, but you want to keep the bounce rate as low as possible. You want to keep people on your site, especially if you have an e-commerce website. You want people who come to your website to purchase. And so here we could see 48% mobile and desktop, it's a little bit lower at 41%. Now, if I look a little bit further at engagement, I can see how many pages on average do mobile users look at. So versus desktop, it's a little bit lower. You can see 3.86 on desktop, it's 4.5. Now, if I look a little bit further in engagement, I wanna be able to measure how long somebody from mobile stays on the website. If they're bouncing at 48%, but they're also looking at 3.8 pages, 3.9, almost four pages per session, then that means in this report, analytics is telling me they're spending about two minutes on the site. And interestingly enough, I can see that mobile over the last 30 days had more transactions. So 51 transactions versus 34 transactions from desktop. And interestingly enough, the e-commerce conversion rate is at 0.29%. That's higher than desktop at 0.07. It's lower than tablet, but it's higher than desktop. And mobile has the most transactions. And since they have the most transactions, they have the most revenue at 2,380. So 
Yes, the engagement isn't exactly as great as it is as desktop, but we can see that people are still purchasing with their mobile devices. So it's something to keep an eye on and mobile is something I definitely look at. In fact, since it's such an important report, one thing you can do in analytics is if you actually like a report and you think you're going to look at that report multiple times, then you can simply just go ahead and click save at the top here. So if I click save, I'm going to enter a name for this report. I'm just going to call it mobile report and click OK. And then what's going to happen is it's going to be located under save reports and save reports is located under customization. Customization is located above real time. OK, so if I close that up, you can see audience real time customization. If I click on customization, if I click on save reports, I should be able to see my save report here and I do. So here I can see mobile report. If I click on it, I can simply go to the report I was looking at before I saved it. So save reports to me is a good feature in analytics because it allows you to quickly access a report that you've saved in the past. So let's take a look at one more report under audience. And let's go to benchmarking. So remember when we were setting up our analytics account, we had the option to opt into benchmarking and I recommended you do so. And so if you did actually opt into benchmarking, then you're going to be able to see how your site compares to others in the same industry. So if I click on benchmarking and then click on channels, what I'm actually able to do now is compare my website with others in the same industry. So if I go back to say jobs and education and I choose education, all education as my industry vertical, I should be able to see websites that are in the same particular industry and how I compare with those websites. So I'm choosing all countries. I can narrow that down if I wanted to. I can just search for the United States. I can choose a specific state and then I can choose a particular site size. So here I'm choosing sites by daily session. So these are sites that have an average of 5,000 to almost 10,000 sessions a day. And so in this vertical education in the United States, sites that have 5,000 to 9,999 sessions per day, that means that there are approximately 310 web properties contributing to this report, okay, based on this criteria I chose. Now, if my site is similar, meaning if I'm in the United States, if I'm in education, and I'm receiving 5,000 to 9,999 sessions per day, then I'm able to compare my site against 310 other websites. Now, Google's sharing this data anonymously from the other websites, and they're doing the same with your website to those particular websites, benchmarking reports. Okay, so it's shared data anonymously in particular industries and verticals. And so now I'm looking at a channel report. So if I want to see how I compare to others in my industry, then I can go ahead and see by channel, for example, am I driving as much traffic as others in my industry? And you could see I'm not. In fact, I'm 76, 77% worse in terms of the amount of traffic being driven from organic search. So anything in red is going to show as a negative result, a negative comparison, whereas something in green is a positive comparison. So if I look at engagement, I can see that I might not be driving as much traffic, but I can see that the pages per session are better than the site average or the industry average. I can see if I go over again, looking just at organic search, I can see the bounce rate is better than the industry average. So the channel report under benchmarking allows you to measure how you compare to others in your industry. And you could do so by looking at location and devices. So if you opted into benchmarking when you set up your account, then you'll be able to compare your website against others in your industry, in your country, region, and based on the size of your website in terms of how many visitors or sessions you're getting per day. So let's go from audience to acquisition. So if audience is who is coming to your website, 
Acquisition allows us to see how the traffic was driven to your website. So how did these users get to our website? And so under acquisition, if we click on overview, we'll be able to see an overview of how users, whether they're returning or new, came to our website. And so what analytics does by default is they have a number of default channels. And when we say channels, we mean analytics is grouping different channels based on how users got to your website. Meaning how did users get to our website? Did they come via organic search? Meaning did they type something into Google and find you in the organic listing? Analytics also groups users based on whether they came to your site directly, meaning did they type in the URL directly into the browser or did they bookmark your website and come back via the bookmark? So they're grouping users under direct. They also group users under referral, meaning did they come from another website? They group users by social. Do they come from a social media platform like Twitter or Facebook? If you're running paid search, Meaning if you're running paid search on say Google, then do they come from paid search ads? Now, if you're running display ads on say Google's network, Google's display network, that's a default channel. So analytics will group users there. So if they don't recognize a channel, then they're gonna group it as others. So by default, Google Analytics groups users on how they came to your website via these default channels. And so I can see how many users came to the site from each channel. Now, if I wanna drill down on this report, I can click on all traffic. And then if I click on all traffic, I can go to channels. I can look specifically at the channels report. And so now I can see organic search, again, over the last 30 days, is the number one channel driving traffic. And they represent approximately, again, you can see this number here in parentheses next to the raw number of users. I can see that number is about 56%. So 56% of my traffic over the last 30 days came from organic search. And so those are the number of users. Again, as a metric, you're also going to have sessions. And you'll see sessions a lot as a metric. So users are broken down between new and returning. So every time a new or returning user comes to the website, basically what they're doing is initiating a session. So you can have a user who can come back multiple times. Every time they come back to the website, it's a session. So session is simply the start of somebody coming to your website and the session ends when they leave the website. And so just like we looked at with the audience reports when it came to mobile, we can also look at engagement by channel. So just like mobile, we looked at bounce rate, pages per session, average session duration. We can do the same thing here with our channel report. More importantly, in addition to behavior, we can see conversions. And since we're running an e-commerce platform, we could see what the conversion rate is by channel. So organic search did drive the most traffic and they did have the most transactions over the last 30 days. And the conversion rate in this case is 0.17. Okay, so how Google determines the conversion rate, they basically take the number of transactions and divide that by sessions. So that means that over the last 30 days, organic search drove 38,123 sessions. And of those 38,123, 64 actually turned into a transaction, which equates to 0.17, which also equates to 3,000 in revenue. So I'm able to determine not only how users are getting to my website, by looking at the channel report, I can actually see if they're engaging and if they are converting. And notice when you look at a report in analytics, you can look at it by channel, you'll also get a summary. So here I can see a summary or a total based on my date range. So I can see over the last 30 days, I've had 54,000 users, 49,000 of them were new. Okay, that meant that out of those 54,000 users, I had 70,000 sessions. I could see my average bounce rate was 43%. The pages per session were just over four. And the average session duration, how long did somebody stay on my website on average? About two minutes and 55 seconds. The average conversion rate 
was 0.14 and had a total of 97 transactions totaling $5,500. Okay, and that's all over the last 30 days. So any report you look at in analytics is going to have a summary. And note that any report you look at in analytics is going to allow you to save it. So if it's a report you think you're going to go back and look at at a future date, then you simply just have to click on the save button. Conversely, if you don't want to save it, you can simply just export it. So you can export it as a PDF. If I click on PDF, it's going to allow me to export that as a PDF. Now you have other options available to you as well. You can do a Google Sheet. You can export it as an Excel or you can export it as a common delimited file. So here you can see I can save it as a PDF if I want to. And if I click OK, it's going to save to my desktop or location of my choosing. And then I can go back and look at it in that format at a later time. So that's the export feature available to you in analytics. Again, if you, you could save it as well or you can export it. Okay, some other reports under acquisition. If you're running Google Ads, note that you can connect Google Ads to analytics. And this is key because now I can see how many people are coming from Google Ads to my website and are they converting? Now this is important because with Google Ads, I'm actually paying for the click. So you can see here, I'm running a report based on campaign data. So I could see what campaigns are driving traffic, how much I'm paying per click, and you could see on average I'm paying 34 cents per click. And then more importantly, I wanna be able to see if they're converting. So you can see I've spent $810 over the last 30 days and received $858 in revenue. So you want to make sure that you link up your Google Ads account to your Google Analytics account. For this very reason, you want to be able to see how your Google Ads campaigns perform once the users get to your website. And so I want to see if they're engaging and I want to see if they're converting. So there are all sorts of reports under Google Ads. So you can look at it by keywords, by search queries, by hour of the day. If you're running display campaigns, you can look at display targeting. So there's all sorts of reports under Google Ads. You just have to link it up and you link it up under the admin. Now there are other reports that you can look at. So if I go to campaigns, I can look at all campaigns. So if you're running all sorts of different types of campaigns, whether that be on Facebook, whether that be email, whether that be, you know, other types of advertising, let's just say Twitter or Instagram, you're going to be able to see those campaigns here. And that's under all campaigns. And again, you'll be able to see the campaign name and you'll be able to see metrics associated with those campaigns. And more importantly, you'll be able to see your e-commerce if you're running an e-commerce platform or if you have goals set up. So you'll be able to look at how your campaigns are not one, not only driving traffic, but two, are they converting? Let's go from acquisition reporting to behavior. So behavior reports are going to actually show you how users behaved once they got to your website, once they landed on a page on your website, how did they behave? So when we looked at audience, we got a sense of who is coming. With acquisition, we get a sense of how the traffic got to our website. Did they come from organic, direct, social, etc.? The behavior reports allow us to actually measure how that traffic behaved once they landed on a page on our website. And so if I go to overview under behavior, now I'm looking at this graph here, it's showing me how many page views I've had. And a page view is simply, once a page is viewed, it's counted as a page view. So if a user comes to my site, they're initiating a session. And if they look at a page, then that page is going to have a page view. Okay, so a user can look at a page multiple times in a session. And every time they look at that page, it's going to count as a page view. So here I can see in this graph how many page views I've had again over the last 30 days. And if I look further at my overview report, I can see the specific pages and how many page views they've had. And I can also look at some other metrics. 
Okay, the average bounce rate, the average time on page. I can look at the exit rate, which means how many people actually exited or the percentage of people who exited from that page. So I can dig deeper into my behavior reporting. So if I click on site content and I click on all pages, then I'm going to look at a report by page. This is my dimension. This is what I'm measuring, my page. And now I can see how many page views each page had over the last 30 days. Now note you also have something called unique page views. So unique page views is equivalent to one per session. In other words, if a user came to my site and looked at the home page, then the home page is going to have one unique page view and one page view. Now, if the user in that same session looks at other pages, then every page that user looks at is going to have one unique page view. However, if the user goes back to a to the same page in the same session, then it's still going to be one unique page view. But in this case, the home page, if they look at the home page a second time, then the home page is going to have two page views. If they look at the home page five times in one session, then the home page is going to have five total page views and one unique page view. Okay, so that's why unique pages is equivalent to one per session, where page views is an accumulation of how many times the page was viewed in the same session. So in other words, you're always going to have more page views than unique pages. Okay, so this gives me a sense of how my page is performed. So again, I can look at total page views and then engagement. So ideally what you want to do with a report like this is if a user is not engaging on the page, then that should tell you something about the page itself. If they're not engaging, if the bounce rate's high, if the time on page is low, if the exit percentage of exit rate is high, then you probably want to do something with that page. Now, these are all pages, but if I jump down to landing pages, my landing page report is showing me how many people actually landed on that page. And so here I can see under my landing page report, I can see the home page had 36,017 sessions in the last 30 days. That's how many people landed on the home page. So here I can see 71% were new sessions, meaning that I had a lot of new users who landed on the home page. In fact, 25,000 or 52 percent of the people who landed on the home page were new. I could see the bounce rates about 42 percent, but of those who didn't bounce, they went on to look at about 4.5 pages per session and spent about three minutes on the site. And the one thing I like about the landing page report is I can also see whether that particular page, in this case, the home page, did it help contribute to a goal or conversion? And in this case, I can see of those 36,000 sessions, I had 22 transactions, totaling 1,200 in revenue, and that's an e-commerce conversion rate of 0.06%. So the home page over the last 30 days contributed to 0.06% of the revenue. So this gives you an idea of when somebody lands on your website and they land on a page, is that page helping to move that person along? Meaning, are they not bouncing? And is that page helping to move people towards converting? And so that's what the landing page in effect allows us to measure is the engagement. And in this case, we're measuring transactions. Okay, so analytics also gives us some other reports under behavior, including site speed. So site speed to me is an important report to look at, just like the mobile report. To me, site speed is important because what Google Analytics does is they take a sampling of pages. And in this case, you can see over the last 30 days, they sampled 2,835 page views. And of that sample, they came back and said, the average page load time is about four seconds. Now, ideally, you wanna keep it as quick as possible. I would say even under three seconds. Okay, now there are other factors involved with page load time. The browser you're using, the country that you're actually browsing that page from might not have the best infrastructure. You may not even be on the best internet network, meaning you're on a cell network or the Wi-Fi is not that great. Or you can be on a page that just has a lot of images or a lot of code that may slow it down. So there are other factors involved. And so 
what Google Analytics does is show you what those factors are. So here I can see by browser what the average load time is. If I want to look at country, I could see what country is contributing to the load time. Now, the great thing about the site speed report is if I go to speed suggestions, okay, what speed suggestions is going to do is it's going to show me the page load time by page. And then it's actually going to provide a link where I can actually click on to get suggestions on increasing the page load time. So for example, I can look at this particular page here, this Google redesign shop by brand slash YouTube page, line number five. If I look at line number five, I can see the average load time of this page is eight seconds, almost nine seconds. Okay, that's an eternity to some people. Now, notice this link next to it. So Google's recommending seven total suggestions. So if I click on seven total, what it's actually gonna do, it's gonna open up a new window and it's going to open up another Google report called PageSpeed Insights. And PageSpeed Insights is gonna give me some information about what I can do to create correct, correct the page load of that particular page. So look at the site speed report. It's important because there is a correlation between site speed or page load time and user behavior of that page. And there's also a correlation between page load time and a page ranking organically on search. So page load time is very important. It's so important that I'm even gonna save it. So I'm gonna click save and click on speed site speed suggestions as my name and click OK. And now that report is gonna be saved under customization under save reports. Let's jump from behavior to conversions. Now, conversion reporting is arguably the most important section in, in Google Analytics because what the conversions reporting allows us to do is see how people are converting or if they're not converting on our website. And so in Google Analytics, we have the opportunity to set up goals. Now you have the opportunity to set up 20 goals in your Google Analytics view. And so to set up a goal, okay, so you're gonna click on admin and under the view, you're gonna see goals. And so if you don't even have goals, the first step is to create goals. And so you have four different goal types in analytics. So you have pages per session. So how many pages per session is so if your goal is set to say three or two, if somebody actually looked at two or three pages per session, it's going to count as a goal. Okay. So if I look here, I could see I have pages per session set at 10. So that means that if a user came to the site, looked at more than 10 pages per session, then it's going to count as a goal. Another goal type is destination. So destination means that if somebody actually went to a specific page, then it's going to count as a goal. And in this case, I can see here that the goal is set to this particular page here. And so when somebody actually lands on that page, it's gonna count as a goal. Now there are two other goal types we can look at. One is duration. So just like pages per session, in our previous example, if somebody looked at 10 pages per session, it's gonna count as a goal. With duration, it's based on time. So in this particular case, if you set up a duration goal and the duration is set to say one minute and 30 seconds, then that means if a user comes to my website and they spend at least one minute and 30 seconds, then it's going to count as a goal. Okay, and then the fourth type of goal in Google Analytics is an event-based goal. So when you set up event tracking, you could turn that event into a goal. So if somebody clicks on, say, the submit button of a form, you can turn that event into a goal. So here you could see the category equals contact form. So you can always verify if a goal works just by clicking on verify this goal. And in this case, this event is turned into a goal. So anytime somebody fires this event, it's gonna count as a goal. So you have four different goal types in Google Analytics. You have pages per session, destination, event, and duration. And so once you've set up a goal, then you can measure goals under conversions. So now if I look at goals overview, 
I can be able to see how many total goal completions I've had. So if I want to look at it by goal, I can just choose the goal option here. So if I want to look at, for example, goal two, engaged users, this was the pages per session, I can see that I had a conversion rate of 10%, meaning that I had 7,000 of all the users who came to the website, 7,000 goal completions, meaning 7,106 users looked at 10 pages or more on my website. And so that's how you want to be able to measure whether users, where they're ever they're coming from, whoever they are, whatever pages they look at, you want to be able to look at the conversion reports to see if they're actually converting based on the goals you've set up, whether that's pages per session, duration, destination, or event, goal conversion tracking reports can help you measure who is actually converting. And then the great thing about Google Analytics here is that I can actually see by segment. So the default segment in a segment is just looking at a specific user set. So the default segment is always all users. However, I can choose a different segment. So if I wanna choose instead of all users, if I wanna choose mobile traffic, I can select mobile traffic, hit apply. So I'm actually now looking at a subset of data. I'm looking at mobile traffic. So of all the mobile users who've come to my site, I can see 1,400 engaged or looked at 10 pages or more, okay? And that's a 7% conversion rate. So the great thing about Google Analytics is you have the opportunity to set up four different goal types. Okay, based on those goal types, you can go to goals overview and look at the conversion rate of each goal, but you can also change the segment of that particular goal to see who exactly converted. Okay, another report I like under conversions is the multi-channel funnel report. So if I click on multi-channel funnel, basically what this allows me to do is see how different channels work together to convert. So remember the channel reporting we looked at under acquisition? Here I can see now how different channels work together to drive the conversion. So if I look at three channels, direct, organic, and referral, I can see all three together drive 2% of the conversions. If I look at direct and referral, 12 and a half percent. If I look at direct and organic, 12.24 percent. So I can see how different channels work together. And so if I look at top conversion paths as an example, I can actually see what channels, how channels work together to drive the conversion. So in this example, I can see over the last 30 days that my top channel grouping was direct times two, meaning that somebody came to the website directly, meaning they typed in the URL in the browser or they bookmarked it and came to the site. Okay, they came the first time but didn't convert. But then they came back a second time via direct and then converted. So that combination is my top conversion combination of the last 30 days. My second best conversion grouping is organic search and direct, meaning that a user came to the website via organic search first, did not convert, and then came back via direct the second time and converted. So basically what analytics does is give credit to the last referral, meaning if you came to the website via referral, a referring website and converted, then the referring website's gonna get the credit for the conversion. But analytics does a good job of showing you how different channels work together. So a channel may drive a lot of traffic like organic search, but that traffic may not convert the first time around for a number of different reasons, whether it could be brand recognition, price shopping, reading content, whatever the case, analytics is able to measure if that channel actually did contribute at a later point. And in this case, we could see organic search drove traffic that didn't convert, but that traffic came back a second time via direct and did convert. So that's our second best channel grouping. And so the multi-channel funneling report, top conversion pass, to me is a good report to look at. So you can actually see not only how channels work together, but you can see sources and mediums and campaigns and how all that, all those different campaigns and different sources work together to convert. So that's just a good report to look at. There are so many different reports available in analytics. 
There's so many that we haven't even gotten to yet. So my advice, if you look at the demo report, you can get a feel for each of these reports under each section, whether that be audience, acquisition, behavior, or conversions. Take a look at these reports, see what makes sense to you, see what you can use to improve your website performance. Now, if you have any comments or questions about any of the reports we covered, feel free to comment underneath this video. We're definitely gonna have more webinars in the future about specific analytic settings that we didn't get to today and other types of analytics reports and features that we didn't get to today. Google Tag Manager, thanks for joining and let's get started with this Simply Learn webinar. So let's start out with YGTM. So let's just say you're Sam and you have your own e-commerce website and you wanna understand how people are interacting with your website. Well, Sam, today's world of websites contain a lot of interactivity, everything from videos to PDF downloads to commenting to form submissions uh, to all sorts of chat functionality, interactivity going on throughout the website. So there's just a lot that you need to track outside of just page views. And so really what GTM does is they help you track all these things I just mentioned. Everything from somebody clicking on the play button of a PDF to somebody clicking on the submit button of a form to somebody entering in something on a chat function. So that's what GTM is. So why GTM? Because it helps us track all that interactivity. So all GTM is is really allows you to really place a piece of Java code, which is just script, and the script that's added to a web page to collect information. So that's really what a tag is. It's just some script that gets put on a web page in order for you to collect information, like page views, clicks, etc. And they send it to third-party tools. Okay, so that's what GTM does. It, it basically allows you to take all these tags that collect information and you can use them in GTM. So if you want to, for example, collect how many people you know enter a chat functionality and start chatting, well, you're gonna take that script and you're gonna put it in GTM, and GTM will then allow you to start tracking that information. So that's really what GTM is. It just allows you to put tags into a container, or think of it as a toy box. You have all these toys and you wanna track, well, you can put all those, those toys or tags in a toy box or container. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but before we get into GTM, Let's just say you know, you're communicating with your developer and there's a new user request on your web page, and you wanna update the tag. Well, your developer, considering it's probably a small update to your website, is probably gonna not um, hesitate and is gonna go ahead and turn around and do it, normally. And so normally what happens is the developer is gonna to go to the website and update the tag. Well, what if you have a few things that you want to track? All those things I mentioned before, from downloads to clicks to you know somebody checking out to watching a video. Well, your webmaster, your web developer is going to go, well, hold on a second. Now, all these requests are going to take time. I need to put them into the work queue, so to speak. Well, what happens is when they go into work queue, usually it's going to take some time. And in some cases, you as a marketer need to launch a campaign. And you wanna get that tracking uh, added to the website in time for the campaign launch. So you wanna go ahead and quickly turn around the tracking for that particular campaign. Let's just say you're launching a campaign and you're sending people to a landing page that has a form submission. And you wanna be able to track how many people click on the submit button of that form submission. Well, if you need to turn that around, your developer's like, well, I need to put that in a work queue. The timing isn't going to always work out between you and your developer is my point. And so that's where GTM comes in because there is a solution to update your tags faster and that's Google Tag Manager. So when we say GTM, that's what GTM stands for, Google Tag Manager. It's a place for you to add tags quickly and easily. So tags, remember, are just snippets of code that allow you to track things on your website interactively. Interactive actively. And basically, when you have GTM, you can bypass the webmaster and do it quickly and easily. So 
That's what GTM is all about. So why GTM? Because we just identified two benefits. One, you could track all the interactivity on your website. And two, you can bypass your web developer or web master. And so that's the benefit of GTM. So the benefit, you get those tags updated very quickly via Google Tag Manager. Okay, so that's what Tag Manager is. So what we're gonna talk about today is specifically what Tag Manager is and what it does. We're gonna list some of the benefits of Tag Manager. We're gonna show you how it works. And then we're gonna show you how to get started with Tag Manager. Tag Manager, if you're not familiar with working with webmasters and dealing with JavaScript and tags and all this jargon is just new to you today, okay, well, don't fret, sit back. We're gonna take it slow. This is an introduction into Google Tag Manager. Again, let's start out with what is Tag Manager. So we've already introduced it to some degree because we already introduced it as a tool where you can put all your tags into a toolbox, toy box, or container, so to speak, right? And we already already mentioned that, hey, you can bypass your webmaster. So you're probably thinking, well, if, I'm, if you're not familiar with Tag Manager, how can I bypass my webmaster? Well, first of all, it's a free tool, and it's a Google tool, hence the name Google Tag Manager. And it helps you really, that's the main point, is deploy and track tags on your website bypassing your webmaster. So that's Tag Manager. And so examples of tags that can be deployed via Google Tag Manager are numerous. These are just some examples like Google Analytics, Facebook pixel tracking, or Google Ads. There's no limit into the number of tags you can track in Tag Manager. There is no limit. You can add any number of tracking tags in Tag Manager. Okay, so some of the benefits, well again, I we just listed two. You can put any tag into Tag Manager and track that onto your website. And we know you can bypass your web developer or webmaster. And what it also does is it also allows you to test and deploy your JavaScript codes quicker. So remember, these JavaScript codes or snippets of codes are just there to track certain things on your website, whether that be a page view or somebody clicking on a play button or tracking somebody who converts or even just goes to your website. So the biggest benefit is you can take that snippet of code, let's just say Facebook. Let's just say you're growing Facebook marketing and you wanna put that Facebook pixel on your website so that you could track people who come from Facebook and convert. Well, you don't need to put that Facebook pixel on your website. You can go right to Tag Manager and you can put that snippet of code right in Tag Manager really quickly. And the other benefit here is all tags are managed in one place. And that's that to me is really a good benefit because when you start adding tags on your website and you have some tags in Tag Manager, it just gets very confusing. So ideally, all the tracking code you have on your website needs to be in Tag Manager. Think about that, all the tracking. So if you're doing Bing, or you're doing Facebook, or you're doing Twitter, or you're doing LinkedIn, and you're doing Google, you're doing all this type of marketing on all these different platforms, you're gonna have tracking code for all these different platforms. And instead of putting all that code on your website, return gonna slow down the slow, low time of your web page and website. You wanna put them all in Tag Manager so they can be organized, and you know exactly what you're trying to track. And the other great benefit of Tag Manager is is there's a versioning control. So let's just say you have added tags to your website via GTM for the last six months. Well, and let's just say you add another tag yesterday. If you added that tag yesterday and something doesn't work, well, you can just roll back to a previous version. It's that simple. So you have versioning and that's that's a good thing. When you have versioning, you can control what gets published and if something doesn't work after it gets published, then you can roll back to a previous version. So it's a, a peace of mind, so to speak. Just because you've added code to your site, there's no guarantee it's gonna work. And so you can always control what version you're dealing with in Tag Manager. And We'll talk a little bit more about that. So the biggest benefit here to me with Tag Manager is you have event tracking. And so we talked about some of the things you could track on your website from videos, from play buttons to somebody clicking on the stop on the video or pausing it all the way to somebody again chatting or let's just say somebody clicking on that purchase button on your website. Okay, and you wanna track all these different things, these different interactivities and buttons. 
Well, event tracking is what you're going to use to track all those buttons. And to me, this is the biggest benefit of Tag Manager. And I'll show you some examples as we go along. And if we didn't mention it already, I'll mention it again. It is free. Tag Manager is free. There's no limit. So once you have Tag Manager going, you can add as many tracking codes as you want. There's no limit on the number of tracking codes you can add to Tag Manager. Okay, so it's free and you can use it to its fullest advantage. Okay, so it's also high security, meaning that it has different levels of permissions. Okay, so you can have uh, somebody just go in and look at the different tags and tracking codes you have in GTM. Or you can ask somebody who is very familiar with Tag Manager and can go in and add the tracking code to Tag Manager and then publish that tracking code when it gets added. So those are all the benefits. Let's talk about how it works now. Specifically, how does Tag Manager work? Because you're like, Rob, okay, again, a lot of jargon. You know, you, you, you got tags and JavaScript and, and versioning and publishing and all this other stuff. Well, I know I'm throwing a lot at you at once, but just bear with me here. Okay, so let's start talking about how it actually works. So, you have a website. Okay, whatever that domain is, you have a website and there's chances are on your website, you have some form of interactivity, whether that be a video, whether that be a blog, whether it be a form submission. You have a website with some interactivity. And let's just say you're even thinking about getting ready to launch some type of campaign on maybe Google or Facebook and you want to drive traffic to your website. Fair enough. You're joining the millions of other websites that are out there that have interactivity that also drive traffic to the website. So in comes Google Tag Manager. And so Tag Manager is important because again, we know we want to track people coming from that Facebook campaign or that Google campaign and interacting with our site. So if you are running Facebook and you are running Google Analytics, well, guess what? You want to put that tracking code in Tag Manager. So Google Analytics being a Google product works very nicely with Tag Manager. Facebook has its own tracking code, but you still want to be able to track people who come from the Facebook campaign to your website. So you're going to get that tracking code from Facebook and put it in Tag Manager. That's generally how it works. So here, information from your website is shared with another data source through Tag Manager. So think about that. If I add Facebook tracking code to Tag Manager, or let's just say I add Google Analytics tracking code to Tag Manager, Tag Manager is the one that's pushing out and doing all the heavy lifting. They're the ones that are controlling what code gets fired and what code doesn't. So if you're putting the code in Tag Manager, Tag Manager is controlling the code. Think about it that way. And let's show you an example of what that looks like. So here I am, I'm in Tag Manager. I just went to tagmanager.google.com and here I could see a list of tags. So in our conversation, we're talking about tracking Facebook and we're talking about tracking Google Analytics. Well, Google Analytics is easy because it's a Google product. So here, if I look at all the different tracking code I have on my website through Tag Manager, let's just take a look at Google Analytics. So if you're going to use Tag Manager, you might as well put the Google Analytics code in here. So here I can see I have Google Analytics as a tag in Tag Manager. Now, for Facebook, if I'm running a Facebook campaign, well, I can take that pixel tracking and put it in GTM as well. And here I could see Facebook pixel. That is, that code is added to GTM. I just basically took what Facebook gave me and put it into Google Tag Manager. So you could see I can add Facebook and Google Analytics. And again, I can't stress it enough, any tracking code from any platform, I can add to Google Tag Manager in order to track the behavior from those sources. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into how Tag Manager works. So I just showed you an example of how you could take Facebook and Google Analytics code and put it into Tag Manager. But if you're not familiar with Tag Manager, then how do I do that? Well, let's talk about the structure and how Tag Manager works. So when you have a Tag Manager account, you have a container. Remember, I mentioned toy box earlier. You have a bunch of toys if they're their code and you're tracking different bits of code from different platforms like Facebook. Think of those as toys and you have a toy box. 
Okay, well that's what this code is, and that's what a container is. The code is the code, and that's gonna go into the toy box or container. And so the way Tag Manager works is you have tags, triggers, and variables. So if I take my Facebook tracking code and put it into a container, I need to set up a tag and a trigger. Okay, so let's take a look at what that is. So first, if I go back to Tag Manager, I'm gonna have an account, and if I have an account, I'm going to have a container. So here I'm just gonna click on an account with a container and a container is nothing more than what website you're adding the tracking code to. Okay, that's all the container is. We're just letting Tag Manager know this is the website we're adding all this code to. So you have tags, triggers, and variables. That's the structure of Tag Manager. So tags are just what it says, tags. What are we trying to quote unquote tag? Well, if it's Google Analytics, that's easy. Here I could see I have Google Analytics added. So if I click on Google Analytics, here's my tag. And if I take a little bit of a deeper dive there, since Google, Analytics is a Google product. It integrates already with Tag Managers. It's pretty easy. I can just choose Google Analytics. Then I'm gonna check page view and that's my tag. Now, every tag needs a trigger, okay? So I need to tell Tag Manager how or when to fire the Google Analytics tracking code. So in this case, I'm gonna tell Tag Manager to fire on all pages. So if I get somebody, a visitor to my website, Analytics is firing on all pages. So whatever page that visitor lands on, Google Analytics is gonna fire. So that's really what it comes down to, is I have a tag and I need to tell Tag Manager when to trigger that tag. That's really what the structure of Tag Manager is. It's tags, triggers, and variables. And variables, what we're gonna talk about here in a couple minutes. But you have a piece of code, you're gonna go ahead and put that into Tag Manager, you're gonna tag it, and then you're going to fire that trigger. So let's take a look at another example here. If I go back here, you can see Facebook. Well, here's my Facebook pixel, okay, that's my tag. So when is it gonna fire? Well, it's gonna fire on a specific domain or subdomain. That's basically what we're doing. We're trying to tell GTM when to fire that particular tag. So those are the three main components, a tag, okay, which is going to contain the JavaScript code that you get from say Facebook, the trigger, so you're going to go into Tag Manager and tell Tag Manager when to fire that code, that's the trigger, and then you have variables. And so variables are basically just additional information that Tag Manager may need for your tag and trigger to work. So that's what a variable is. It's there to get the tag and trigger to fire. So variables are divided into built-in and user-defined variables. So common user variables include say page path or page URL or host name or click class again they're there and these examples I just gave you are there to get your tag and trigger to work think about it that way they're just that's a component and if I go into tag manager here and here on the left side I can see variables so remember I have built-in and user defined so built-in means that tag manager already built these for me so in case I need to get my trigger to work with my tag I can use a variable so those are built in and then I have user defined. So these are what I define, these are what I created. And again, the variables are there to get the tag and trigger to work. Okay, so that's the job of the variable. The job of the tag is to host that JavaScript code. Okay, in the case of Facebook or analytics, that's where we're putting our code. So here, if I click on AdWords remarketing, again, it's a Google product, so I don't really need to even deal with code. I'm just gonna select Google AdWords remarketing. Okay, so you could see GTM integrates nicely with some of the other Google products. But let's just say you have a Facebook pixel tracking code, you're gonna choose custom and you're gonna put the code here. So that's part of the tag. And then the trigger again is there to get the tag to fire. So you're telling GTM when to fire the tag and the variable is there to help you make sure that that trigger and that tag work together. So that's how all three kind of work together. 
You need the tag to put the code. You need the trigger to tell GTM when to fire the tag and code and the variables there to help you define when that tag and trigger should work or how it should work. So again, review tags are they're just small codes of JavaScript or tracking pixels on your website. And so tags are allowed to manage events like scroll tracking, remarketing, clicks, downloads, files, play buttons, you name it even clicks on external links. For example, let's just say you have a click uh, or a Facebook uh, icon on your site. And when somebody clicks on it, they go to Facebook, you wanna maybe track that, you're gonna create a tag. Okay? The trigger is there because you need to tell GTM when to fire that tag. So it's a certain condition, whether it's you know fire the tag if the URL equals facebook.com or some other condition. So the tag, cannot be created until the creation of the corresponding trigger. So tags and triggers go together. You can't just create a tag and not have a trigger. Otherwise, your tag will never fire. And then the variable is there again. It stores the information when defining a trigger or transferring data to tag. So a variable has a variety of data, okay? So you pick and choose the variable you want to use with that trigger, okay? So you're making sure that by defining a variable, you're making sure that you're telling GTM how that trigger should be fired. So let's take a look at another example here of how all three play together. If I'm in this account, I'm in this container. If I look down here, I could see Google Optimize. That's another Google product. So what I'm doing here is I just chose Google Optimize as my tag. It's already integrated. So what does that mean? I don't even need to deal with any code. I'm just gonna select optimize. Well, we have the tag Google Optimize, but we need to tell GTM how to fire that. And so here we're going to tell GTM to fire it on all pages. So that's basically a very simple example because we're firing it on all pages. So if I wanna look at something specific again, Facebook, Here's my tag, here's my code. What's my trigger? Well, my trigger is it's gonna fire on specific pages. How do I know that? Well, if I look at the trigger, here I could see the trigger is a page view, but I'm telling it to fire on this particular host name. So the tag and trigger go hand in hand. <music>
the container. And then one thing I wanted to mention on the account is it's a Google account. So when you create your account, then make sure it's the same account you use with say Google Analytics or some other Google product. That's a good best practice is always use the same email address when you set up your account so that it integrates nicely across all the different platforms. Meaning you can go from say Google Analytics right to Google Tag Manager in one browser without having to log out or log in. Okay, so when you create the account, you're gonna create your container. If you choose web, then you're gonna be asked to place code on your website. And when you place that code on your website, then you are free to start using Tag Manager. And that means you're free to start adding tags. Okay, so if you wanna know more information about installing Google Tag Manager, then what I would recommend is visit the Quick Start Guide website of GTM. So again, if you're curious as to where that code is located in Google Tag Manager, well, when you create an account and you create a container, that container is gonna have a specific ID. So if I click on that specific ID, here's where I can get my code, okay? So again, when I'm logged in to Tag Manager, I'm gonna click on Workspace, but in the top navigation, I'm gonna see my unique GTM ID. If I click on that, that's where my code is gonna be located. And so again, your code needs to go in the header, and there's another script that needs to go in the body. And if you're not sure how to add the code to your website, well, you can always click on the quick start guide here, okay? And that'll take you to a quick start guide page, a reference page related to Google Tag Manager. So let's talk about creating a tag. So once you get Tag Manager installed, I'm sure you're excited to get going and create that first tag. So let's talk about how to create a tag in Tag Manager. So when you're in Tag Manager, all you need to do is basically you're looking at all your tags. If you click on tag in the left side navigation, you'll see all your tags and there's a new button there. So you just click new. And so basically what you're gonna do is you're going to create your first tag. And so what I would recommend once you get Tag Manager installed on your website, I would recommend setting the first tag up as Google Analytics. So that will get you going with tracking page views on your website when, some, when somebody visits your website, okay? So ideally, that's what you wanna do. You wanna get Google Analytics as your first tag in Tag Manager. So what I'm gonna do is because Analytics is a Google product, it's already integrated nicely with Tag Manager. So I'm just gonna click on Google Analytics. It's going to be a page view, that's what I'm tracking. And now I have to set up a variable. And so what it's going to do, it's gonna ask me to set a, select a variable. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna select new variable. And what you're going to do is you're actually gonna go and add your tracking ID here. That's gonna be your variable. So where do I get my tracking ID in analytics? Well, if I'm in analytics, I'm gonna to go to admin and then under property settings, I'm gonna see my tracking ID. And all you need to do then is go to tag manager, and paste copy. First, you got to copy over that tracking ID. Then you're going to go to Tag Manager and paste it. And then that's going to create a variable for you. And then when you create that variable, you're going to see it in the drop down here. So I've already created it. And basically, that's your tag with a variable. Then what are you going to do? You're going to set up a trigger. So see, I have some triggers already set up. You're going to see a default trigger already set up for you and that's gonna be all pages. So ideally what you wanna do is you wanna select all pages in order for analytics to fire on all pages. So that's what we're doing. We're setting up a trigger. We're basically telling Tag Manager, hey, if I get a visitor to any page on my website, then I want you to fire Google Analytics. So that's basically, in summary, how to set up your first tag. And my recommendation is your first tag should be Google Analytics. And when you set up analytics, you're gonna have to set up a variable for the tracking ID. And so you get the tracking ID again from admin, property settings, copy and paste that tracking ID over, save it, you have your variable, that variable is gonna be included in with the tag, then your trigger is gonna be all pages. And there you go, you have your first tag, you have your first variable, 
you have your first trigger. So that's basically what you want to do. And once you've added that tag, once you've added that trigger, then the only thing you need to do now is basically publish the tag. And so anytime you save a tag, you're going to go ahead and submit it. So that way it gets published. So again, what you're going to do is let's take a step back here. You're going to choose new tag. You're going to choose analytics from the drop down menu. You're going to choose page view. Then basically you're going to add your tracking ID so you could set up the variable. And then basically that's what you need to do. Okay. You're going to add that tracking ID and then voila, that's your tag with a variable. And then once you've done that, then you're going to click submit. So when you click submit, you're basically saying, Hey, I want this tag to go live now, this tag and trigger. And once you've done that, then analytics is ready to go. And anytime somebody goes to your website on any page, tag manager is going to fire Google analytics. So the great thing here is you have something called Google tag assistant, and that's a, an extension that works with Chrome. And so when you've actually added tag manager to your site, or you have analytics running in tag manager, you can confirm if those tags are firing properly. So let's take a look at how Google tag assistant works. Okay, so if you just do a search for Google Tag Assistant, you're gonna see here that it's basically just an extension that works in Chrome and it unfortunately only works in Chrome browser. It doesn't work in any other browser. So go ahead and install that extension into Chrome. And when you do that, you're gonna see this nice icon here in your browser. And now if you go to any website and I click on Google Tag Assistant and I click on Enable, Okay, so basically I'm loading Google Tag Assistant. And now once I refresh the page, I can see that this particular site has Google Tag Manager installed. And not only does it have Tag Manager installed, I can see that it's also has Google Analytics running. I have also Google Optimize running and I have Google Ads Remarketing Tag running in Tag Manager. So that's what Tag Assistant does. It allows you to see if one tag manager is on the site and if it is great what other tags are firing on this particular site so tag assistants telling me i have these particular tags firing on that site and they're firing within tag manager so tag assistant is a great way to confirm if one tag manager is on the site and two what other tags are firing on the site now Another way you could confirm if Tag Manager is firing on the site is you can go into preview mode. So even before you submit and publish your tag and trigger, you can click on the preview mode. So if I click preview in Tag Manager, so basically that's going to put me in preview mode. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that now I'm free to go to my website and see if those tags are firing. And so let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I go to the website and just click refresh, then what's going to happen is tag manager is going to load in preview mode, just as you see here. Okay. So that's going to take a second, couple seconds to load up. And now what can I see in preview mode? I could see that I have GTM firing, but I also have some other tags firing on this page. Remarketing. I have Google analytics. I have Google optimize. I have some other tags firing as well. And so the preview mode shows me what tags are firing on any given page. And I can also see what tags did not fire. Okay, so here I have a number of tags already in GTM, but they didn't fire on this particular page. So let's just say I clicked on the donate now button. I'm still in preview mode. So I'm gonna be able to see what tags fired. Now I could see I have a couple of tags that have fired on this particular page. And then I could see what tags did not fire on this page. Okay. So that's the preview mode. You can use the preview mode before you even submit a tag and trigger to see if it fires. And that's the great benefit of tag manager. So if you're not sure if something's going to fire or not, then you can always go into preview mode. Um, and if you are sure it's going to fire, then you can go ahead and submit it. So you can leave preview mode and just go ahead and submit that particular tag and trigger. So here I'm going to leave preview mode. And now once I'm done and I'm sure the tag is going to fire and go ahead and submit all my changes that I've worked on in terms of setting up tags and triggers. So that's really 
GTM in a nutshell. So I have my tags, okay? My tags are just snippets of code that I'm going to put in, whether that be Facebook or vet tracking or any other Google product like Optimize or PageView. Then I have my triggers. My triggers are there to tell GTM when to fire that tag. And the variables are there to help those tags and triggers work together. So remember that particular variable we set up for Google Analytics, okay? So here it is right here because we wanna tell GTM what property to specifically fire in Google Analytics. So that's why we set up that variable. But there are all sorts of variables. Google Tag Manager has built in or variables already created for you or you can specifically define a variable. So variables are there to help the tags and triggers work together. So when you set up a tag, you set up a trigger, you use a variable, you can always go into preview mode, preview it by going to the website, seeing if it fires. If it fires, then voila, you can go ahead and click submit and that will publish the tag and trigger and you're good to go. That's pretty much how Tag Manager works. And again, I can't stress that there is an unlimited number of tags you can add to Tag Manager. There's no limit. So you got everything from anything from Google to non-Google to event tracking, okay? To Facebook, to anything that you wanna track, you wanna be able to put into Tag Manager. And again, there's versioning. That's one of the great benefits of Tag Manager. So if I wanna go back to an older version, I can simply do that. So here you can see I'm on version 32. That's how Tag Manager works. And I can't stress that, you know, Tag Manager is there to help you track interactivity on the site. Because if you have a site that's interactive, that has a video, that has a download button, let's just say, you know, you have all sorts of newsletter signups, Facebook, YouTube buttons on your website, just like this website does, and you wanna be able to track how many people click on that particular button, well, you're gonna need Tag Manager. And when you have Tag Manager, you're gonna be able to track all of these button clicks and interactivity on your website. Today, we're gonna to talk about how to rank number one on Google. So let's get started and um, let's go with the scenario that you have a friend named Sam and he has a website where he sells shoes. But Sam doesn't understand why his website's not ranking number one on Google. And so typically, to rank number one on Google, there are some factors involved. And those are factors that are gonna help Sam get his website rank number one on Google so he can sell his shoes, get traffic and convert that traffic to conversions. So there are factors involved. And so what are those factors? Well, it always starts with keyword research. So in order to rank for a website where you sell shoes or you sell products, other products like clothing or food, or you're an automobile website, you know, you're a mechanic. It doesn't matter whether you're selling to customers or selling to other businesses. You have to start with the keyword research. And so we're gonna go into really explicit detail on how to conduct a proper keyword research. And then the second factor involved is high quality content. So in order to rank high on Google search, you need to have high quality content. So we're gonna go over what's involved with creating high quality content. Then we're going to take that content, we're gonna optimize it using on-page elements and website level factors. So we're gonna take into account what's involved with your website and what's involved with specific pages on your website in order to rank number one on Google. Then we're gonna get into the offsite engagement. So when it comes to ranking on Google, you need to optimize your website and you need to do some elements off your website. You need to be engaging off your website, meaning on other websites. And so we're gonna talk about what's involved with offsite engagement. So SEO being a major channel for most companies and websites where the opportunity to drive a lot of traffic is there, but you have to earn that reward. The reward is a lot of traffic, but you have to earn the reward and there's a lot of work involved. And so ideally what we wanna do is follow what we call the 80-20 rule when it comes to search engine optimization and ranking on Google. And what do we mean by the 80-20 rule? Well, 
80-20 means we're investing 20% of our effort and 80% of the results are obtained. So we want to invest 20 and get back 80. That's basically what we mean by 80-20. So for example, if 20% of our targeted keywords bring in 80% of the traffic, then that's following the 80-20 rule or 20% of our landing pages drive 80% of the overall traffic, that's following the 80-20 rule. Or 20% of our backlinks pass 80% of our link juice, that's the 80-20 rule. Meaning these targeted keywords, these targeted landing pages, these trying to target backlinks using off-site engagement. We wanna put in 20% of our effort on those keywords, landing pages, and backlinks in return for 80% of the results. So without further ado, let's get started with the keyword research. Let's talk about that keyword research for a website with shoes. And, and it doesn't really matter what particular product you have. If you need to rank number one on Google, it all starts with the keywords as I mentioned before. And so in this example, if you have a website where you sell shoes for kids, you're going to want to be found for certain keywords. So the obvious keyword here would be shoes for kids. Well, every keyword that you target has search volume associated with it. So that means when we talk about search volume, we're talking about how many people on average type in that keyword or related keyword on google.com or Google search. And there's always an average number of searches associated with every keyword, and we call that search volume. How much search volume? So obviously, if we're gonna target a keyword, we wanna have as much volume as possible. However, there's always going to be competition for those keywords, meaning there's always gonna be other websites who wanna rank number one on Google for the same keywords. And we call that competition or difficulty. So for every keyword, you're going to have volume and you're going to have competition or difficulty. And the difficulty ranges as well, depending on the tool you use. And we'll get into that in a minute, but search volume is how much on average people are typing in that keyword or close variants of that keyword. And the difficulty is measured in terms of how many other websites are trying to rank for the same keyword. And so ideally, when it comes to keyword research, we wanna find that nice balance. We want high volume and we want low competition. But at the same time, we wanna focus on keywords that are highly relevant to our business. So if we're selling shoes for kids and shoes for kids is highly relevant, has high volume and low competition, then that's a keyword we wanna target. So we always wanna focus in on those three areas. So there's always a trade-off with keywords. So shoes for kids might have high volume, but also might have high competition or difficulty. If we look for another keyword that's just as relevant, for example, shoes for children, it may still have high search volume, but the competition or the difficulty may be lower. And if that's the case, then that may be a better keyword for us to target. Instead of something highly competitive like shoes for kids, we can focus on another relevant keyword like shoes for children with just as much volume and lower competition. And the reason why we want lower competition is because we want to be able to rank for that keyword. So the higher the competition, the harder it is for us to rank number one on Google for that keyword. And so the whole idea beyond keyword research is analyzing and choosing the best keywords. So we want to identify a list of keywords that are always relevant. We want to choose the keyword that your competitors are ranking for. And we want to use third party tools to choose keywords to identify which keywords have low competition and what keywords have high search volume. So one thing to take into consideration when you're doing keyword research is that the longer the keyword phrase, or in other words, long tail keywords or keywords with three keywords in the phrase or more, you're gonna always have less competition, but there's always a trade-off. With long tail keywords, meaning the longer the keyword phrase, there's gonna be less volume, but the trade-off is less competition. And so what we wanna do is we wanna brainstorm some ideas and find those relevant keywords. So let's look at an example here. So if we go to Google Ads, so Google Ads has a tool called Keyword Planner. And let's just say I have a, a website where I'm selling dried 
dried figs. And if I'm selling dried figs, I want people to buy these dried figs. However, in order to attract them, I want to be able to show them that, hey, we have a, a bunch of recipes. And if I show you a bunch of recipes where you can use dried figs, maybe you'll buy these dried figs to use in these recipes. And so we're going to look for keywords related to bread recipes because if we can optimize for our recipes page for bread then that will attract an audience who wants to make bread and use dried figs with those bread recipes so that's the example i'm going to give here and so if i look at the keyword planner in google ads if i just type in bread recipes what google is going to do is they're going to give me an average monthly search volume so i can see the average monthly search volume here is 60,500 and so in order to do keyword research what I would recommend is keep a spreadsheet and so the idea behind the spreadsheet is to document the volume and the competition you're getting for certain keywords so if I go into a spreadsheet here my theme of keywords is bread recipes my keyword is bread recipes and my volume therefore is going to be 60,500 however if I go back into Google Google's keyword planner Google's telling me the competition is low so that's great I want high volume I want low competition but how low is low so we want to be careful so if we're going to put in numbers into a spreadsheet we want to figure out what that competition really is for the keyword bread recipes so if I go to Google and just type in bread recipes, I'm going to be able to see 771 billion results for the keyword bread recipes. Now, is 771 billion our real competition? Maybe, maybe not. What we want to do is put in a syntax and we want to put in the syntax all in title and then colon, space, and then our keyword. And the reason why we do that in search is because we want to be able to identify the true competitive number or the true number of websites who are trying to rank for bread recipes and if we put in the syntax all in title colon and then our keyword bread recipes we'll be able to see that there are 998,000 results that's a lot lower than 771 billion so that means that 998,000 sites or listings have the keyword bread recipes in the title title tag and the title tag is what shows up in the search engine results and so if I look down and scroll down here I can see bread recipes are in every one of these title tags so title tag is an important element to rank number one on Google and we'll talk about that in a few minutes but if we understand that there are 998,000 results with bread recipes in the title tag then this tells us that those are the websites who are trying to rank number one on Google for that keyword and therefore those are the websites we need to jump over in order for our website to rank number one on Google and so therefore I'm gonna put in 998,000 in my spreadsheet as the competitive number and so now I could see for the keyword bread recipes I have 60,500 and if my comp competition is 998,000 then my KEI or keyword effectiveness index or in other words the ratio of volume to competition is 6% so that's nothing more than volume divided by competition so that tells me that my KEI or my ratio between volume and competition is 6% so remember we want more more volume than we want competition so anytime you do a keyword research you're going to find a number of different relevant keywords so if I go back into Google's keyword planner if I typed in bread recipes you could see that Google is going to give me a number of different keywords related to bread recipes let's just say I have another keyword that I want to think about optimizing for or being ranked on Google for and that's banana bread recipe very similar keyword as bread recipes except it's a little longer tail now if I type in banana bread recipe in Google's keyword planner now I can see the average monthly search volume has actually gone up it's 368,000 I can also see the competition is low so those are good signs so now I can see 368,000. I'm going to go ahead and put that in my spreadsheet. Now I'm going to go into Google. I'm going to put in my syntax all in title. 
I'm gonna put in banana bread recipe. I'm gonna hit enter and now I can see I have 233,000 results with the keyword banana bread recipe in the title tag. So if I look at the title tags, I can see banana bread recipe, banana bread recipe, banana bread recipe on all the listings in the Google search results. So that tells me I have 233,000 results that I have to jump over in order to rank number one on Google. So I'm gonna put 233,000 in my spreadsheet. Now I can see my KEI or my volume to competition ratio is 157, 158%. And so to me, that's a lot better number to work with, or in other words, that's a lot better keyword because it's just as relevant and it has a higher ratio of volume to competition. So therefore, banana bread recipe is going to be a better keyword to optimize for in order to rank number one on Google. So that's the whole idea behind keyword research. You wanna brainstorm ideas. There are plenty of tools out there. So the tool I recommend is Google Ads Keyword Planner. Google's gonna give you how much search volume. They're gonna tell you the competition, but then you're gonna go into Google search. You're gonna use the syntax all in title to get a more accurate read on the actual competitive number. And so to find out how keywords that your competitors are ranking for, you can use those keyword tools that I mentioned. Another tool that I use is Moz. So Moz, if you go to moz.com, they have a tool called Keyword Explorer. So if we just type in the keyword, for example, bread recipes, it's going to be able to tell us how much volume and the difficulty. So you can use other tools at your disposal, figure out the volume and the difficulty. There are plenty of tools out there. But the one thing I would just make sure is you use everything at your disposal. So you can use social media to find the most shared article for a particular topic or keyword like bread recipes. You could check other platforms that have a lot of shared content like Reddit and Quora, where you can ask people about certain topics using keywords to figure out how much competition or volume there might be. You could stay up to date on industry news to get an idea of what types of keywords are trending. But when it comes to keywords and keyword research, remember for every web page, we want to be able to pick two keywords. We want a primary and secondary keyword. Word. So when we do keyword research and we enter all our keywords into our spreadsheet, we want to be able to have a number of different keywords. In this case, we're focusing on the theme bread recipes. We want to have different keywords because we want to be able to choose a primary keyword and a secondary keyword because we want to be able to focus on multiple keywords for each page because we don't want to put necessarily all our eggs in one basket, meaning we won't want to put all our emphasis just on one keyword to rank for. We want multiple keywords to try and rank for. So the primary keyword can define the nature of our business. The secondary keyword could be just highly relevant to our keyword. At the end of the day, we want to choose multiple keywords to try and rank on Google for that page. So for example, we have a blog and we're using ice cream recipes and we're blogging about ice cream recipes, we can have a primary keyword that is about ice cream recipes or homemade ice cream recipes. We're gonna always wanna find out what the volume and the competition is. Our secondary keyword could be built around other similar keywords like low fat ice cream recipes or fat free ice cream recipes or low fat homemade ice cream recipes. Those are complementary keywords, just like our bread recipes and banana bread recipe. So one thing we wanna do when we do keyword research is we wanna be able to target one keyword per content when you can target many. We wanna be able to target multiple keywords, not necessarily target one keyword. And so we want to be able to cluster keywords. So we don't want to target just one. We want to target multiple keywords per page. And when we talk about clustering, if we go back to our keyword research, what we're doing is we're clustering a bunch of keywords under the theme bread recipes. And so by looking at the volume, looking at the competition, looking at the KEI, we can choose different keywords for our page.
And that's what we mean by clustering. We want to cluster keywords into a content theme. So why target only one keyword per content when we can target many? Because we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. We don't want to target just one keyword. We want to target many. And so that means clustering your keywords into a theme and choosing multiple keywords for that particular page. And when we do that, we have a better opportunity to rank high on Google search and the whole idea behind ranking high on Google search is we can get the volume. So if we know we're ranked number one on Google search for bread recipes or banana bread recipe, we know we stand a chance of getting a majority of the volume associated with that keyword. And if we can get the volume and get the traffic, then we can get the conversions. So let's move on to high quality content and talk about the impact content has on your ability to get your website ranked number one on Google. So let's just say you have content on your website and the content is ranking on you know, page four of Google and it's that blog with ice cream recipes. And if it's just content for the sake of content, it's not really informative, then it's not necessarily gonna get good engagement. In the eyes of Google, you know, they wanna rank content that's very informative, it's very fresh, it's exciting to read, it's interesting, it's going to have good engagement. So if it's a recipe or an article about any topic, if it's the content is just not informative, then you're not going to get good engagement. And when you don't get good engagement, if people don't stay on the site to engage in the content and they just leave the website after landing on the page, causing a bounce, then the content is just going to continue to fall down the rankings. And we want to prevent that. We want to move up the rankings. We want to be number one on Google. We don't necessarily want to fall in the rankings for our content. So content is a key driver in being able to rank number one on Google. So if the content is on page nine, what can we do? Well, we want to be able to, you know, take that content and do something with it. We feel like we did write engaging content, so let's go ahead and share it on social media. And to me, social media is a good platform to share your content because on social media platforms like Facebook, for example, you're building a community on that platform. That community is already interested in your content. So if you're sharing an ice cream recipe, especially in the summertime, and you're engaging with your community on that platform, then the likelihood of that community on that platform is going to increase engagement. Increased engagement will send social signals to the search engine that says, hey, this content is good quality. Likewise, for any other platform, most social media platforms have engagement metrics and those engagement metrics pass signals. Is it good, is it not good? Do we like this content? Are we giving it a thumbs up? Are we gonna wanna follow it? Are we gonna wanna share it? And so if you share content that you feel is engaging on social platforms, then it's gonna be engaging and it's likely going to cause an increase in engagement, for example, a decrease in bounces. Mm -hmm. And once you share that quality content, then the likelihood of it moving up the rankings, even as far as number one on Google, is gonna be greater. So you always want to start out writing good quality content. So let's talk about good quality content because Google does take content seriously. They do take into account what other people think of that content. So high quality content is an important factor. So how to create good content? That's always the question. So let's talk about some best practices here. Remember, in the last segment, we talked about keyword research. So we want to perform good keyword research. Why? Because we want to choose keywords. Remember, we're choosing multiple keywords per page. One keyword could be related to our brand. One keyword could be related to the content, but another keyword could be related to a user's intent, like recipes. If you recall the example we use with bread recipes, maybe somebody's looking to type in a keyword that says, how do I make, you know, a bread? Or how do I make a specific type of bread? Or how do I make banana bread? Or what's the best recipe for banana bread? They're question related. And we want to be able to answer those questions. So that's where choosing those right keywords that's going to respond to a user's intent. So starts with choosing the right keywords. So 
Remember, we talked about a number of different tools when we talked about keyword research. So there's a research tool that you can use called phrase.io and that will help you do quick research on you know keywords and trends and whatnot so if you know a better research tool that you use for keyword research then drop us a comment below i'd be interested in getting your comments about keyword research and what research tools are out there so if you know something better than phrase.io drop a comment below and we'd be interested in getting your perspective so keyword research is key but creating content that fulfills users requirements so answering those questions if it's a recipe we want to answer that question if it's directions we want to answer that question if they don't know how to do something we want to answer that question and that's the whole idea behind content content is not just to fill a page it's to really fulfill users requirements that's when you get good engagement so if somebody's typing in something on Google and they're looking for an answer your content should answer that question but we also want to make the content readable so in other words you know write for your audience don't impress anybody with very high vocabulary type words that somebody doesn't necessarily know the meaning of don't use jargon don't use a street language for example use everyday common language that's just easily digestible when your audience is reading and then we want to keep that content organized and so when we mean organized we want to use headers and subheaders you know break your content into paragraphs keep the flow organized if we can keep the flow organized then it's going to be easier for somebody to read and then it's okay to add resources especially resources from credible sites so if you can incorporate those resources in there then it's just going to add the credibility to your content let the audience know that hey I've done my research on this topic and this is what this person has to say about it this person who seems to be credible okay so it only adds value to your content so these are all tips to remember when creating content and then the one important tip here is we want to use white hat techniques and when we say white hat techniques that means you know if we've chosen keywords that are going to answer somebody's question we don't want to stuff those keywords into the content we want the content to be naturally written so when we say opt for white hack uh, techniques that's what we mean write the content naturally keep it organized keep it readable include third-party sources and make sure it answers a question so there are different types of content so there's content where you just write words it's all text-based you could also use an infographic an infographic is simply just a graphic that visualizes exactly what you're trying to explain for example if we want to write an article about how to write good engaging content we don't necessarily have to write all that out as a text we can create an infographic so for example Here's an infographic on 20 effective ways to basically not bore your readers, but write engaging content. So you can see this is an infographic. It's all graphically laid out. So infographics tend to be easier to understand because they're visual. They're easy for the end user to comprehend because there's generally no jargon. It's usually images that are portraying the point of what you're trying to get across. And so it tends to break it up, the monotony of just text. It's more visually appealing and it's laid out and organized. So you can see this infographic has 20 different steps or rules and they lay those out all here in this infographic. And the great thing I like about infographics is you could, you could share them on social media. You can re-engage them as a post. You could save them on really any social platform. So infographics tend to tell a better story versus say just writing text. You can use video and images so you don't necessarily have to lay it all out in an infographic you can certainly insert a video or an image into your content especially if it's a blog post if it's a blog post then sometimes video and images on its own tell the story you don't necessarily need text to go ahead and tell your story a video or an image as they say tells a thousand words and so images and videos are great to use in a blog post so using different forms of content you know you always want to review your content when a user dwells on your web page for a longer time 
Google will tend to think, okay, this person's engaged, so we're going to rank that favorably. So if you're using infographics, videos, and images, then the chances of somebody being more engaged are going to increase versus just text that's not well organized and written out in a way that somebody doesn't necessarily understand. So be creative in the types of content you use. So longer engaging content tends to bode well with search engines. So this is according to HubSpot. So the more word count you use, the more words you use, the chances of you ranking higher are gonna be better. Just take into account best practices. You wanna maybe break up the content with an image, organize it, make it engaging, use headers. So it's not necessarily just words, it's the words and how those words are written, how they're structured, the types of keywords you're using, how you're engaging with your audience. There's a lot of factors, again, there's best practices we just went over. But the key is, you know, if you have longer, more engaging content, then it's going to bode better for you on search engines. So a couple of steps to create high quality content. So you wanna begin with a comprehensive introduction. So always introduce your content. Remember the content should be relevant to the keywords. So if you're choosing keywords in your keyword research, think about answering that question. If somebody's typing in bread recipes, maybe they're looking for banana bread recipes. How to make the best banana bread or how to make banana bread using dried figs. We want to be able to align our content with that keyword naturally. You want to create a title that's worthy, that's click worthy. So remember, if you're in Google search and you're doing search for something simple like bread recipes, we want to make something that's going to be you know, engaging for somebody to click on, like easy, perfect yeast bread or easy crusty french bread or something that's going to be engaging you know the best bread recipes or how to make the best homemade bread you know something that's going to draw somebody's attention to the title of that blog post so we want to include lsi keywords so what i mean by lsi keywords in your content we mean you know long tail keywords make it natural headings and subheadings should consist of keywords and variants so if you're writing headers and subheaders, include the keyword in there. And that way, the, the content always stays relevant to the audience. Okay, shorten your sentences and paragraphs so don't write long paragraphs. Remember, we wanna break this up. We wanna make it easy for the end user to read. And we want to always put internal links on our blog post. Why? Because if we have internal links, then if we have a link from one blog post to another blog post, or say our blog post to an internal page on our website, we wanna make sure that it's relevant content. That way, if somebody's reading something and you have an internal link, let's just say from a bread recipes page to a banana bread recipes page, then they may find it interesting, click on that link and go to the banana bread recipes page. So it's keeping somebody engaged on your website. So putting in internal linking will help keep the, the end user engaged because you're offering up links that's relevant to the content. You always wanna break up that content with images, okay? We wanna use alt tags, meaning we want to pen the image with text so that way if the image doesn't load then at least the alt text will load so we can incorporate call out boxes and more importantly we want to update our content regularly so we always want to get the best recipe out there if it's banana bread or different ways to create banana bread or always just coming up with ways to update the content so we want to keep our content our blog post fresh and then we want to include a CTA, a call to action. If we include a call to action, then that's going to keep somebody engaged and have them act on your content. So these are steps to creating high quality content. And so let's look at an example here. And this is a three month old post on Buzzfeed. And it, it's 21 pictures that restore your faith in humanity. So it has a lot of likes, a lot of tweaks, and that means it's engaged. People are engaged when reading that. And so if we go and look at it as an example, we could see it on Buzzfeed here, 21 pictures that will restore your faith in humanity. So this was written back in 2012. Again, a lot of engagement. But if we look at it, 
we can see immediately that it's taking into account third party sources. It's got some content, it's got images, it's being broken up by images. We could see there's call to actions on there in the form of social so people can go ahead and go ahead and share it if they like it. Okay. It includes videos, it includes images, third party sources. So it's a good post because listen, you know, it's engaging content. It's probably answering somebody's question about humanity. And we could see clearly that, look, you know, there's a lot of different examples here from a lot of different sources and we could take action on this content. So not just video, not just images, but text as well. And so it's very engaging, answers questions, takes into account the different types of content available. So this is a good post in that regard. So content's updated regularly, it's engaging, and it includes sources from high authority websites. Some do's and don'ts on the content. So take into account the best practices I mentioned about creating high quality content. Okay. Answer those questions that the end user wants to hear, you know, because that likely is going to be their search. And so you want to be able to respond to the end user. That's part of creating high quality content. Different types of content, i.e. in the form of infographics or videos or text or images. You can add images from public domain sites. You can be relatable and use examples to clarify points, just like the BuzzFeed article. Simplify complex words. Don't use sophisticated language. Talk to your audience as if you they were standing right in front of you. And use bullet points to exemplify your examples, your points. So some do's, the don'ts, obviously don't lift content. We don't want to lift content from another website. So that's plagiarism. So we want to have our own unique content. We also don't want to take images from other websites. And so if you do happen to find an image that works for your post and it's on somebody else's website, ideally that's not a good situation. But if you do happen to do that, then always give credit to the website. Okay, so if you took it from xyz.com, credit xyz.com for the image. And even put a link back. But ideally, you don't want to take images from other websites. Just as much as you don't want to take copy, you don't want to take images. Use your own imagery and content. But if you don't have imagery, then you can always go to stock photography. There are plenty of websites out there where you can sign up for a subscription like uh, Adobe Stock Images as an example. You can sign up for an account and in some cases you can sign up for a free account and use stock imagery. Okay, don't give less information to your audience. Give your audience what they deserve, which is the information they're looking for. They're looking for the best banana bread recipes. Give them the best banana bread recipes. Incorporate your own images. Break it up with titles. Give them a good quality piece of content that they're going to be able to engage with. And so if you put long paragraphs in your content, then it's going to be less engaging. So try to avoid those long paragraphs. Remember, shorten up the paragraphs, keep the language simple, add in images, answer those questions, use third party credible sources, but write it in your own words and you should be on your way to creating good quality content. Okay, so now that we've talked about high quality content in order to get your pages ranked high on Google search, let's turn our attention to optimizing on-page elements and discuss some website level factors that are both gonna help you rank high on Google search. So let's just do an overview of what we're talking about when we talk about on-page elements and website level factors. So optimizing on-page elements include a number of different things. But primarily, we're going to focus in on meta tags, also known as meta description tags, header tags, also known as title tags, and URLs. So those are just some of the on-page elements we want to be able to optimize using relevant keywords in order to rank high in Google search. We also want to take a look at some website factors that will affect our ranking on Google search. They include website architecture having a secure website, having a sitemap, and taking a look at page speed. So all of those are some of the website factors we need to take into account in order to rank high on Google search. So title tag and meta description together are considered 
meta tags. So both play an important role in ranking high on Google. So we want to be able to write unique title and descriptions for each page on our website. When I say unique, that means the title and the meta description need to be different for every page on the website. And so if you're not quite sure what a title tag and a meta description tag is, if you go to search and just type in any particular search query, the title tag is what's going to show up here in bold. And then the description is going to show up below it, below the URL, and that's going to describe the page. So both of these meta tags are important because it describes what your page is all about and that's what Google uses in the search results pages. So we want to be able to pay attention to the length of our meta tags. So if we go back to our search results pages, met title tags are generally 60, 65 characters. Meta description tags are generally 160 characters. So anything really longer than that, then what's going to happen is the meta description tag or the title tag will get truncated. And so if we look here, for example, we could see all of the title tags here fit the 65 character limit. But if you run over the character count on meta description, then Google is going to truncate the copy. So you want to stay within your parameters in order to avoid getting your content truncated. And so the other thing when we're writing title meta description tags, we want to minimize keyword repetition. So if we're optimizing for keyword, we don't want to necessarily just plug that keyword into the title tag and meta description multiple times. We want to make sure our title tags and meta descriptions are naturally written. So if somebody's typing for banana bread recipe with dried figs, you know, we want to have a nice title tag and a description that is going to get somebody to respond uh, based on their need. And so we definitely want to avoid keyword repetition, but we want to be able to use that keyword in the title tag. Because if you remember from the earlier segment, when we did the all in title syntax to find out exactly how many competitors were using that particular keyword, well, we obviously want to use that keyword in the title tag because again, the title tag is an important factor when it comes to search engine results. So we want to use the keyword, but we want to avoid stuffing or using it repetitively in our title tag and our meta description. We want the title tag and the meta description to describe the page, sound natural, but also be engaging because the point is we want people to click on our link and go to our website from search engines. So title tags with numbers tend to result in higher click through rates. This is according to Moz. So for example, if you just put in a title tag that says learn digital marketing, well, that may work, but if you put a number in there, like five easy ways to learn digital marketing, that might get somebody to click on your link and go to your website. So having questions in your meta tags can also increase your click through rate. For example, if you just put learn the importance of first page rankings, not too bad, but again, generic. But if you put it into the form of a question, how to rank number one on Google, it's more action oriented. It's going to get somebody to resonate with the question that they have. And that may be their query, how to rank number one on Google. And so these techniques will help you get higher click through rates. And so according to Backlinko, title tag with a keyword can improve site ranking. So remember, we want to include that keyword in the title tag, even though we only have 65 characters, we want to include that keyword, but we want to avoid stuffing the keyword in there. We want to again, make the title tag action oriented, maybe with a number, maybe as a question with the keyword in there once naturally, not easy to do, but that's the beauty of SEO. If you can follow these best practices and write a good title tag, then the chances of you improving in your search results are going to be greater. So having only one H1 tag in your post is going to be good. So remember when somebody clicks on a link, so let's just say they do find a title tag engaging and they click on this, this link here and they go to that website, you know, you want to start out with having that particular H1 tag because the H1 tag, especially with the keyword in it, is going to signal to Google, hey, 
We're organizing our page, and because it's an H1 tag, it's important. We're structuring the page according to best practices. So having only one H1 tag in your post is definitely helpful. Having multiple tags, H tags in your post, help organize the page a lot better. So we wanna add that targeted keyword in that tag, and your header tags should be relevant to the content. So if we go back to our example of the using dried figs with banana breads, well, the title says California Fig Banana Bread. And remember the last segment when we we're talking about high quality content? Well, look no further than including a video into our content. So not only will this video help keep the engagement high, but it breaks up the monotony of the page. And it's from a third party source, so it adds credibility to the page. So adding a video based on the last segment of high quality content definitely helps with ranking high on Google search. So following hierarchical structure, that means putting those H tags in there. H2 tags help break up the content. And we want to avoid repetition of H1 tags on your different web pages of your site, meaning don't just put the same H1 tag with the same keyword in it and keeping it blase. We want to make those H1 tags exciting to read, but also used appropriately to break up the content. So remember, all white hat techniques. We want to avoid hidden tags. We want to avoid stuffing keywords. We want things to be natural. We don't want things to be forced. And your H1 tag should be 20 to 70 characters. Don't make long H1 tags. So if we go back to our page example, a short, sweet tag here, California fig banana bread. It's relevant to the content. It's short, sweet, and it breaks up the monotony of the content. And more importantly, and again, any content you have on the page should always answer the user's intent. Remember, people are using search to answer questions, find information. Our content should be able to answer that for them. So according to John Muller, Senior Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google, header tags would definitely help Google for rankings in the search results. So we want to use header tags. So when it comes to URLs, we want to use hyphens and avoid underscores. So if we look at this URL here, this uses hyphens, fig and banana bread. So it's all broken up with hyphens. That's a best practice. Remember, canonical URLs. A canonical URL signals to Google this is the original content. So we want to use original content. And if you have multiple sources of content out there on, say, different websites, we want to use a canonical tag to signal to Google this is the original content. Please index this content. And that doesn't hurt to use a favicon in URL, meaning a small icon. It helps to break up the monotony and help your URL stand out. We can add targeted keywords in the URL. So again, looking at the URL here, I could see we're using targeted keyword as part of the URL structure. Fig and banana bread. And notice the H1 tag is fig banana bread. So it's all consistent and it flows naturally. URLs that are no longer existing, then we want to be able to set up a redirect for those URLs, meaning a 301 redirect is a server response for Google that says, hey, Google, this page is no longer available, but it, we permanently redirected it to this page, which is now available. So that's what a 301 redirect does. It helps signal to Google and all the other search engines that if the page is no longer there, that's fine. You're just going to go to this page. This is the page that's permanently there now. And another thing we want to do here is if you have mobile URLs, you want to include those in the sitemap. And we're going to hit on that in just a minute. But all URLs should be mobile friendly as well as desktop friendly, meaning take into account those best practices. Keep your URLs short, use hyphens, put the keyword in that URL, and make it easy to understand. You want to avoid capital letters in the URLs. The URLs URLs are case sensitive, so go lowercase. You should always go lowercase on the URL. Readable URLs, again, the rule of thumb here is if you understand what the URL is, then Google's gonna understand what the URL is. So the shorter the URL, the easier it is to read, the easier it is to read, the better chance you have to rank high on Google search. So according to Backlink2, URLs that are shorter definitely, definitely help you rank. 
So we want to be able to shorten those URLs. Keep them short and sweet. Don't make them long and unreadable. So those are some on optimized ways or on page elements that help you optimize. Now we want to look at some website level factors that will help you optimize and rank high on Google search. So good site structure provides better crawling for search engine bots. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean having your site organized in a fashion that Google's going to be able to find all the pages. So what do we mean by that? Create a logical hierarchy structure. So if you're selling shoes, you know, you're going to have a home page, break the structure up into men's shoes, women's shoes, children's shoes. Then under men's shoes, you could have it by brand. It could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. On the women's side, it could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. On the child side, it could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. And so you want to keep the structure flow in a hierarchy. So we want to balance the amount of subcategories within each category. So the men's, if it has Nike, Puma, Adidas, the women should have Nike, Puma, Adidas. And so you want to code your site navigation in CSS or HTML, meaning we want to be able to use something that Google is going to be able to index. So most sites are built in HTML and that's what Google likes to index. They like to index something that they could take back to their servers. And then more importantly, build a comprehensive structure for internal linking. So internal links mean that if you're on a site, you should have natural links pointing to other pages on your website. So to keep the flow going and we don't want to have unnatural inbound links you always want to have natural internal links to keep the flow of the user going from one page to the other so here I could see as an example all the ingredients in this recipe well this has an internal link to another page on our site and this happens to link to a page where somebody can buy the ingredient so it's a natural internal link so John Doherty of Credo has claimed that one of the biggest changes that he can make in fixing the Credo website is architecture. So for example, in Credo, John Doherty has increased the organic sessions by 74% and pages by per session by 41% just by changing the site architecture. So you'd be surprised by changing the site architecture what that will do to engagement. And so let's our, turn our attention to secure versus non-secure. So what we mean by that is secure in your site we want to make it sure that compliant with certain protocols and so if we go back here we can see that this particular site is compliant it is secure HTTPS means it has a secure license meaning the site is secure so Google likes secure versus non-secure so non-secure would be HTTP so we want HTTPS as our protocol and what that means is just enabling SSL certificates and that means when you enable an SSL certificate that means your domain or your protocol is going to be turned to HTTPS so Google prefers sites that are are secure versus non-secure. So if you use HSTS as a protocol, that adds an extra layer of security over the HTTPS. And HSTS prevents cookie hijacking. So adding multiple layers of security always helps. In my opinion, if you have an HTTP website, a non-secure website, you should look into buying an SSL certificate, getting your sites flipped over to HTTPS, because what's gonna happen is your URL structure is gonna change. When your URL structure changes, Google's gonna recognize that because they're gonna index your site. And when they index your site, they're gonna see those secure URLs, and that's gonna work favorably in your favor and help you rank higher on Google search. So websites using secure or HTTPS have a higher chance of ranking higher. So HTTPS is a ranking signal because Google indexes those pages. So let's also talk about sitemaps. So sitemap is one of the most important ways to improve your website ranking. Why? Well, because sitemaps are a way to organize all your URLs into one file. So we're basically going to a prioritize all our web pages in a sitemap. So if you go to any particular website and you type in sitemap XML, you're likely going to see all the pages on your website. So usually the sitemap is located in the root directory. So if I type in sitemap.xml, 
I'm going to be able to see all the pages in my root directory. And I can also prioritize them. I can also alert Google as to how often they change. And every page is going to have a date stamp associated with it. So Google can actually see how often it changes. So remember, we want our content to be updated frequently. So if content's not updated frequently or it's not fresh, then Google's going to see that site, that, that date stamp, that last modification date. So we want to be able to make sure our content's updated frequently. We want to let Google know that we change it frequently. And we want to be able to prioritize our pages, let Google know, hey, these pages are important to us. So all that can be set up in a sitemap. We want to be able to add canonical versions of URLs in the sitemap. So we want to be able to add all our original URLs in our sitemap. And so we always want to build dynamic URLs sitemaps for larger websites. And what I mean by dynamic URLs, that means that if I look at this sitemap and we're always adding content, let's just say in the form of a blog, well, guess what? We want those pages to be added to the sitemap as they're published. So as we add pages to the blog or to the site, then they should automatically be added to the sitemap. And so in effect, what's going to happen is we're going to be able to see the sitemap grow with more URLs. When the sitemap grows with more URLs, then that means then Google's going to index more pages. They're going to index more fresh pages. So they're going to be able to get those pages that are just published quicker. So that's the whole idea behind dynamic sitemaps is we want to be able to capture all the URLs just as they're published. And we want to be able to maintain our sitemaps. And so I would always recommend a dynamic sitemap, but you can always create your own sitemap just by going to a tool called XML sitemap. So if I just type in XML sitemaps into Google search, here I could see XML sitemaps generator, and I can be able, if I have a small website, just create a free and simple sitemap on my own. When XML sitemaps creates it, or your platform creates a dynamic sitemap, either way, the sitemap's going to sit in the root directory. And then what we want to do in turn is let Google know where that sitemap is. So in Search Console, we want to be able to submit the sitemap. So you're going to add the sitemap. You're going to let Google know where it is. It should be in the root directory and it should be called sitemap.xml. And when you do that, Google's going to be able to take those URLs and index them. So we could see we submitted 528 URLs, Google index 521. So one thing about URLs here is when we create a sitemap, we're putting all our URLs in there. We do not add no index URLs in your sitemap. And what that means is that any URL we don't want Google to index, we're just going to exclude from the sitemap, okay? So we want Google to take all the URLs we want indexed and put them in the sitemap. So according to Edgy, using sitemaps for SEO can increase your website's visibility and help you get indexed. Why? Because what you're in effect doing is taking all your URLs that you want indexed, you're telling Google how often they're modified, you're telling Google which ones are important, and you're submitting that to Google. And so Google's gonna be able to take all these URLs quicker, index them quicker, and when they're indexed quicker, you can get ranked quicker. And when you get ranked quicker, you can get traffic quicker. So that's the whole idea behind sitemaps. So let's turn our attention to page speed now. So one of the last factors for our website, besides architecture, making it secure, and adding sitemaps, is we wanna take a look at how quick our pages load. Here are some tips in order to optimize page speed because ideally the quicker a page loads, the more engaged the user is going to be. If it takes a longer time for the page to load all the elements of that page, then what's going to happen is the user is going to get impatient, maybe leave the website altogether or go to another page. And so we want to be able to optimize images. So any image that's of large size in terms of megabytes, we want to be able to optimize that, compress the image. So that's one way to speed up page speed. We want to use a simple website design you know, HTML with CSS or cascading style sheets. Just a simple design with simple 
a hierarchy in website navigation structure. So nothing fancy, nothing complex, just a simple website design with optimized images. We want to leverage browser caching and we want to upgrade the server response time, meaning all your files are sitting on the server. So when somebody goes to a web page, the server is serving up all of those files, the images, the text, etc. And so we want the server to respond as quick as possible. So when it comes to page speed, we can look at the factors affecting page speed in Google Analytics. So if I go to Google Analytics and I go under behavior and I go under site speed and I go to overview, I'm going to be able to see what my average load time is for my site. And ideally, we want our pages to load as quick as possible. So that means anything under four seconds, anything four seconds or higher, and it's likely the end user is going to leave the page. There's a correlation between page load time and bounce rate. And so what Google actually does is give you speed suggestions. So if we do have a page that loads slow, we can just go to speed suggestions in Google Analytics. And we go to speed suggestions, then Google's gonna be able to tell us, hey, this particular page load fast, this particular page loads slow. And if it loaded slow, why is it loading slow? So here we could see the home page as an example is loading on average of seven seconds. Well, if we look here, they're gonna give us some suggestions. So if I click on this page speed suggestions, it's going to load a report and a tool called PageSpeed Insights. And basically what it's then going to do after it's done running is it's going to tell me all the ways in which I can optimize my pages, not only for desktop, but also for mobile. So here I can see for desktop or for mobile, I can look at some ways in which I can optimize it to increase page speed. For example, sizing my images properly, server response time, reducing my server response time, avoiding multiple page redirects. So there's a lot of opportunities that we can do to speed up page load time. And all that's found in Page Speed Insights and all that's found within Google Analytics. So remember, optimizing code, minimizing redirects, optimizing your images, upgrading your server response, and all of those are factors. And so again, you can go into analytics, page speed insights, and you can see exactly what Google is recognizing as what's lowering or slowing down your page load time. So Google takes site speed as one of the most important ranking factors. Why? Because they're going to rank pages, not only with high quality content, that are relevant to the keyword queries, but they want those pages to have a good user experience. So if somebody clicks on the page, then the user should be able to see that content fairly quickly. And so that's why it's such an important factor. So the quicker your pages load, the chances of you ranking higher are gonna be better. So according to Web Performance Today, Walmart, as an example, experienced a decline in conversions. So what they did was looked at their page speed. And when they looked at their page speed, you'd be surprised what that did. Just increasing it from one to four seconds or decreasing it basically increased conversion. So there's always going to be a correlation between how quick a page loads and how engaged the user is. Because if a user is engaged, they're going to stay on the site. And if they stay on the site, then their chances of converting are going to be higher. So just even one to two seconds increase in page load, load time will make a world of difference in terms of engagement and conversions. Let's turn our attention to offsite engagement. So previously we talked about on-page elements and website factors that affect our rankings for search results, but we also need to turn our attention away from our website, meaning what we do on our website, and turn our attention what we can do for our website off our website and onto other websites. So that's off-site engagement. And so let's look at an example. So that ice cream recipes blog.
Thanks Rob. With that, we've reached the end of this complete SEO tutorial. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Do like and share it. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more from Simply Learn.